Now 7 p.m. I'm reconvening to open session and calling to order the regular Board of Education meeting for Indian Prairie School District 204 on Monday, April 26, 2021. Jeannie, will you please call the roll? Ms. Deming. Present. Mr. Rising. Here. Ms. Peel. Here. Mr. Razak. Here. Mr. Karubis. Here. Ms. Donahue. Here. Ms. Grover. And before we begin, I, I personally want to thank the community and the Board of Education for your support during my physical absence as I care for my family member. We still have a long way to go, but your support has been really appreciated. Thank you. Ms. Peel, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America we now move to board salutes and I think Ms. Peel you're doing double duty today all right um, the board salutes Nadan Gajapala, a senior at Niqua Valley High School, who was one of approximately 1,000 distinguished high school seniors to have won a corporate-sponsored National Merit Scholarship Award in the 66th Annual National Merit Scholarship Program. Scholars were selected from students who advanced to the finals level in the National Merit Scholarship competition and met criteria of their scholarship sponsors. Corporate sponsors provide National Merit Scholarships for finalists who are children of their employees, who are residents of communities the, com the company serves, or who plan to pursue college majors or careers the sponsor wishes to encourage. Nadun's award was financed by Macy's Incorporated. Congratulations, Nadun, on this stellar achievement. Thank you. We now move to our student representative report. We have a new student representative from Matia Valley High School, and that's Saad Qureshi. Welcome, Saad. <laughs> and there he is. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Uh, if you could speak up a bit louder, please. Okay. Thank is you. it okay if I take off my mask? Oh, no, I think we, we do need to keep on oh, the okay. mask. I'm okay. sorry. I'm sorry. My apologies. Good evening. My name is Saad Qureshi, and I am the 2023 class representative for Matia Valley Student Government. I am very excited to join you all tonight. Matia Valley PTSA hosted a senior celebration to hand out gift bags, t-shirts, senior signs, and senior signs. We had around 500 seniors come over two days. Thank you to our amazing PTSA for hosting this event. We have over 200 students registered to attend our prom event on April 30th. Have a great and safe time, Mustangs. On April 14th, eight of our athletes are committed to compete at the next level. Good luck to these Mustangs in their future endeavors. Mateel celebrated our awesome administrative assistance on Wednesday, April 21st, and our hardworking teachers and staff over the past few weeks. Thank you to our incredible teachers and faculty for all that you do. Black and gold, IP scholars, senior road trip, and graduation plans are in the works to create memorable experiences for the class of 2021. That's all that I have for the April board report. Thanks, everyone. Until next time, go, go Mustangs. Thank you, sir. Welcome. Next on our agenda is Outstanding Service Awards. Dr. Talley. Thank you, Mr. Razak, members of the board, and uh, members of the Indian Prairie community. I would like tonight to celebrate three of our students for the outstanding work they have done this year as high school student representatives. Each month, we have heard from our student reps as they have shared information about their high schools, the work that their fellow students have been doing, and the successes earned by their peers. These students, who all have a full academic and social load, have come prepared and ready to represent their schools, their students, and their community. Two of our representatives are seniors and will be moving on at the end of the year, 
and one is a junior. So tonight, we want to salute the three representatives and give them a token of appreciation to all three of them. So I'd like now to call to the stage, to please come up onto the stage, our representatives, and Mr. Rising and Ms. Grover will present the awards. We have Ms. Emily Shaw, a senior at Wabonzi, who will be going to the University of Michigan next year. We have Ms. Brooke Pigius, a senior from Atia, who will be going to Loyola Marymount University in California. And Mr. Sean Fieldman, Jr. at Niqua, who will be still with us next year. So we'll bring them up, and as I said, we'll give out their awards. Oh, congratulations. For your service. Our next item is uh, recognitions and proclamation. So I'd like to call Miss Lori Price to the stage to give out a proclamation or two. Hello. Um, some of you know me. You all up here know me. Um, my name is Lori Price, and I'm here on behalf of State Representative Stephanie Kipowitz's office. She's in Springfield uh, this week, but asked me to send her thanks to all of you board members for serving and a special congratulations to Kathy and Mike. I'm also here as a former board member and a friend of the two being honored tonight. And it is my honor to be here to present these to them. So without further ado, um, Kathy, or I'm sorry, Mike, could you come up? Mike, for your distinguished service to not only District 204, but the 204 community at large. We have a House of Representatives House Resolution to present to you. This is a little lengthy, so bear with me. Yes. This is House Resolution number 210, offered by Representative Stephanie Kifowit. Whereas the members of the Illinois House of Representatives wish to congratulate Michael Mike Razak on the occasion of his retirement as president of the Indian Prairie School District 204 Board of Education. And whereas Mike Razak earned his bachelor's degree in education and special education and his master's degree in special education from Northern Illinois University, and whereas Mike Razak is a retired educator 
With 38 years of experience as a teacher and administrator, he began his career as a teacher and later became the principal of the Ray Graham Habilitation Center. He also worked for the LaGrange Area Department of Special Education, the School Association for Special Education in DuPage County, and Butler School District 53, where he started one of the first inclusion programs in Illinois. He joined Indian Prairie School District 204 in 1991. He served as a middle school assistant principal, a middle school principal, and an elementary school principal. And whereas, during his career, Mike Razak led schools that received numerous honors, including the Association of Illinois Middle Schools and the National Forum to Accelerate Middle Levels Schools to Watch, the National Association of Secondary School Principals, 100 highly successful schools, and the Illinois State Board of Education's Exemplary Business Partnerships Award, and the Academic Excellence Award for High Student Achievement for five consecutive years. He has been honored in the community as a recipient of the Indian Prairie District 204 Parent Diversity Advisory Council's Equity Champion Award, the Naperville JC's Outstanding Educator Award, and the Illinois State Board of Education's Those Who Excel Award. Whereas, while on the Indian Prairie School District 204 Board of Education, Mike Razak served as Vice President from 2015 to 2017. He became President in 2017 and has served in that role until his retirement through continued professional development and training with the Illinois Association of School Boards. He achieved and maintained Master Board Member status. He was also designated a Fellow in the Association's Leadership Academy. And whereas, Mike Razak has also served as the President of the Association of Illinois Middle Schools, the President of the Illinois Association of Persons with Severe Handicaps, and a member on the Illinois State Board of Education Steering Committee on Autism. Therefore, be it resolved by the House of Representatives of the 102nd General Assembly of the State of Illinois that we congratulate Michael Razak on his retirement as president of the Indian Prairie School District 204 Board of Education. And we wish him many happy and healthy retirement years. And be it further resolved that a suitable copy of this resolution be presented to Mike Razak as an expression of our esteem and respect. And this was adopted by the House of Representatives on April 15, 2021. And I just want to say, Mike, you've been a friend to me for several years, and um, I know that's not going to change, but um, you've done a, just a tremendous job with this board. You've had a lot to deal with, and you've handled it with such grace and class and professionalism. So thank you for that, and thank you for your friendship. Uh, now can I have Kathy up here, please? Yes, please. Thank you. Hello. Since you are our most senior member on the board currently, I figured I'd save you for last. Um, again, you've given so much to District 204 and to the community. So we have a resolution for you. And again, this is House Resolution 209, offered by Representative Stephanie Kifowit. Whereas, the members of the Illinois House of Representatives wish to congratulate Kathy Peel on the occasion of her retirement as a member of the Indian Prairie School District 204 Board of Education. And whereas Kathy Peel is a longtime resident of the Indian Prairie community, she earned her bachelor's degree in psychology 
from Eastern Illinois University. Go Panthers. She later earned her master's degree in social work with an emphasis in administration, policy analysis, and community organizations from the University of Illinois Chicago. And whereas Kathy Peel was appointed to fill an unexpired term on the Indian Prairie School District 204 Board of Education in September 2008, she has served many roles on the board, including secretary from 2011 to 2013, and vice president from 2013 to 2015, and through continued professional development and training with the Illinois Associations of School Boards, she achieved and maintained master board member status. She was also designated a fellow in the Association's Leadership Academy. Whereas Kathy Peel is an active volunteer with the Parent Diversity Advisory Council and the Indian Prairie Parents Council, she served as an IPPC representative and a legislative chair of the Watts Parent Teacher Association. Through PDAC, she introduced dialogue circles, which offers various stakeholders within the district an opportunity to work together and share their experiences on sensitive to topics relative to the school community. And whereas Kathy Peel brought to the Indian Prairie School District 204 Board of Education a passion for cultivating strong partnerships between schools and the community. Therefore, be it resolved by the House of Representatives of the 102nd General Assembly of the State of Illinois that we congratulate Kathy Peel on her retirement as a member of the Indian Prairie School District 204 Board of Education. And we thank her for her service to the community and be it further resolved that a suitable copy of this resolution be presented to Kathy Peel as an expression of our esteem and respect. And again, this was adopted by the House of Representatives on April 15th, 2021. And Kathy, I have some, just a few personal words for you. Um, when I first came to the board, you were a mentor to me. We became friends. We probably were friends before that even. But we've been friends for a long time, and you've been a tremendous mentor to me as well. And I see that you have been a mentor to everyone here on this stage. So what you do for this board and for this community is so much appreciated and respected. And you've not only made me a better board member, you reminded me to think and look through a different lens on many different issues. And I see you continuing that work forever <laughs> in whatever you decide to do after retirement. But thank you for all that. And um, I just appreciate everything you've done. Mr. Karubas and Ms. Donahue. Thank you, Ms. Price. Mr. Karubas and Ms. Donahue, you will make your presentation. All right, mine's for Kathy also. So, Kathy from the Board of Education. We have our proclamation for all of your efforts and work on this board. So whereas Kathy Peel was first appointed to the Indian Prairie School District 204 Board of Education in September 2008, and successfully elected multiple times thereafter to serve on the school board, as an active volunteer in the community, she has dedicated extensive time and energy to organizations both within and outside of the school district and whereas during her tenure on the Board of Education, Ms. Peel served as the Vice President, she also assisted in the search process to select the superintendents who would lead the district, and whereas Ms. Peel served on the leadership team of Indian Prairie's Parent Diversity Advisory Council since 2006, and led the implementation of dialogue circles to help improve the educational experiences of students 
And whereas Ms. Peel has committed to continual professional development and became a member of the Illinois Association of School Boards Leadership Academy in 2010, she also earned the designation of Master Board Member from the Illinois Association of School Boards. And whereas Ms. Peel has worked as a tireless advocate to raise awareness concerning school safety related to school buildings being used as polling places on election day, now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the District 204 Board of Education, Administration, and Community honor Kathy Peel for her outstanding service. We thank her for her willingness to actively participate as an elected official and volunteer leader, which has been of great value to all stakeholders in the district. We wish her all the best as she concludes her final term on the board and leaves behind a legacy of caring and commitment to our school district. And from a personal perspective, I also echo what Lori said. You've been a mentor to many of us and a role model, and I can call you a friend forever. So thank you so much, Kathy. Yeah, I might as well. Huh? <laughs> uh, um, uh, I'm going to start by saying how unlikely it was for me to be on this board, um, especially since it requires so much public speaking. Um, when I was in sixth grade, I tape recorded a presentation to my sixth grade class so that I could play that instead of speak in front of the class. Um, when the Board of Education was determining whether they wanted a high school, a third high school, I dragged my husband along to support me because I was so afraid of speaking at public comment. How ironic is that? Um, I am not comfortable with public speaking, but here I am. So why do you want to be on the board was a question I've been asked so many times. Typically, I have said my kids' experiences and an opportunity to practice interviewing was what <laughs> made me apply. But in reality, um, it comes down to my passion for believing in the potential of every person. This passion has got me advocating for equity, then the high school, and then for the approval of a referendum on the high school, and eventually why I applied to be on the board. And it is also why I'm a social worker. I will always believe that adults have the power to create an opportunity for inspiring students to do something great with their lives. And a school board has a place for making that possibility greater or dampening it. Public schools in the United States are a treasure. However, we all know they are not the perfect institutions we want them to be. Many people advocate for more choices for our students I do. I want those opportunities available. In our district, we have many. But sometimes, such as tonight, where we have to consider this town of school, we lose our way to do so. This is not the only time we have cut a program that serves some students in a better way. We cut the Frontier Campus for students who weren't tied too much of the extras of high school. They simply wanted to get done with their degree and go on from high school. We had a program that created an inclusive atmosphere for them to do so. And it was a great loss when we cut it. Not having the funds to do everything we can to meet our students' needs has always driven me crazy. We are a district rich in resources, yet we have had voices create an atmosphere of there's not enough to go around. I disagree. The bigger loss is when we have students who are not inspired to care what their life will lead to. It's like not investing in your 401k. But dealing with the reality of competing interests is the job of a board member. And as someone who is currently working in a school, I can also say that the real essence of inspiration will not come from our programs, but from the adults serving our students every day. 
I read a note of mine from a workshop years ago. It said, culture trumps everything. The reason programs like the STEM school and the Frontier Campus were successful is because they created a culture that focused on inspiring our students. How do we do that? We focus on giving our teachers the breadth and bandwidth to create a relationships with our students. The pandemic created quite a challenge to us all. For some families, it may have helped to bring each other closer together as many busy activities were removed from their daily lives. But for many of our students, they are missing the connections they made or could make. There's a great deal of psychological theories around connection. Many land on connection as the place where we feel most present with our core self, we feel safe, and we can gain strength. My hope for the future of our district is we continually focus on creating that opportunity of connection for our students. Check in with those who are avoiding it. Don't blame them for not being connected. Find out who they are and fertilize that relationship with them. And this starts at the top. And for now, the top is uh, the new team of eight. So make sure your demands of staff provide time to make authentic connections. Make sure they have time to connect with each other. It is not all about programs. Programs are what will provide skills. And if our students are inspired, aren't inspired, they will not care about the skills. And lastly, make sure our students leave our doors with some sense of purpose in life. I hope soon we will see an improvement on our mission statement that includes developing the compassion to care for others. Without it, our mission statement stops at the individual. And if nothing else, I hope this past year has taught us how much we all depend upon one another because we are all connected. So now is the part of the remarks that I begin to sound like the Academy Awards. First, I want to thank all the administrators, coordinators, directors, staff who have answered all my questions over the years, always with the greatest of respect. Um, I have learned so much from all of you in so many ways, and I thank you. Um, I owe, I thank my teacher, the, all the teachers too, for all your efforts to make this district an awesome place to learn. I thank you for your own advocacy for our students. And I owe my husband Mike a great deal for supporting me with my decision to apply for the position. He had advised me not to. I may finally be able to give him a party for his birthday since it has always fallen on graduation weekend. <laughs> um, and my fellow board members. I had actually toyed with the idea of leaving you with Whitney Houston's lyrics of I will always love you. Because <laughs> this has been a true gift to be a part of this team and with previous board members too. I thank you for the connection I've enjoyed with each one of you. And lastly, I thank the community for trusting me for so many years. It uh, really blows my mind, that kind of trust. So thank you, and new board members, that trust is gold. So hang on to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think my microphone is having some problems. That's perfect. <laughs> now I'm up for the board's proclamation on board president Razak. Whereas Mike Razak was elected to the Indian Prairie School District 204 Board of Education in April 2013 and appointed president in May 2017. As a lifelong educator, he brought a unique perspective to the board, continuing to serve District 204 in a volunteer capacity after his retirement from Indian Prairie. And whereas Mr. Razak has been a voice for diversity in the Indian Prairie School District 204 and has been an active member of the Parent Diversity Advisory Council 
for nearly 18 years. He advocates for each student and is passionate about each student achieving the district's mission. And whereas Mr. Razak has profound respect for the District 204 community and believes that every stakeholder has a voice, he diligently listens and responds to the questions and concerns of all stakeholders. And whereas during his tenure as school board president, Mr. Razak and the board commissioned a group of stakeholders to lead Engage 204, the district's community engagement program to inform the board of the community's priorities for the school district. As president, he also oversaw the search process for the current superintendent. And whereas Mr. Razak's leadership led to receiving the Illinois Association of School Board Presidents 2018 and 2020 School Board Government Governance Recognition Designation, which acknowledges school boards that have engaged in activities and modeled behaviors that lead to excellence in local school governance in support of quality public education. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the District 204 Board of Education, Administration, and Community honor Mike Razak's unwavering dedication and tireless devotion to the students, teachers, and parents of our community as he leaves a legacy of placing children at the forefront of all decisions. We are immensely grateful for his decades of service. Although we will miss his kindness and his sense of humor, we wish him all the best as he closes his final chapter in Indian Prairie School District 204. Thank you. Got somebody up there? Here we go. So I have a few comments also. After 64 years of nonstop school, <laughs> it appears that I have finally graduated. But I'm wondering if this is just a social promotion. <laughs> Nevertheless, it is important to express my gratitude to the District 204 community for trusting me to provide direction to the district, to the three superintendents during my term of office. Apologies are probably more appropriate, but I want to thank you for your guidance and thank you for your patience. To the district administration who answered my thousands of questions and met with me hundreds of times, thank you for your level of detail and professionalism. To Lori Price, Betty White, not that good to do this, <laughs> Maria Curry, my current fellow board members, you have fostered in me the concept that learning never ends. I've been blessed to work with high functioning professional learning communities throughout my entire life. You are the best. I have learned so much from you. I continue to be inspired by your service. I have appreciated your professionalism and collaboration, even though we have disagreed. To my wife and children, you had to sacrifice for my participation. There are actually no words to express my appreciation. Finally, thank you to all the candidates that put themselves out there to run for office during this election cycle. To my returning board members and to our two new elected board members, I leave three new thoughts. From me, and Kath just learning never ends, always keep the district's mission statement at the forefront of your decision making. And I think you need to give serious consideration to the addendum that Ms. Peel just discussed. From Teresa of Calcutta, who stated, the good you do today will often be forgotten, but do good anyway. 
She also said, give your best, and of course it will never be enough, but give your best anyway. And finally, the mentors who have formed me and kept me going during the last 64 years of school and 69 years of life are our students and children. And this is finally from a former student, Rochelle Manda, who in her graduation speech said, we can appreciate life's greatest highs because we have fought past the lowest lows. And she says, nothing is better than who we are together. The long-term future of our district is actually very bright, but it will require many short-term tough decisions to achieve that bright future. It will be difficult and it will be challenging, but just remember, Nothing is better than who we are together. Thank you. Thank you, Madam. Yep, and it's now term. Uh, Mr. Razak, one last thing, if I may. Sure. Uh, not to, uh, it's difficult to follow the two of you in speaking. We have two more gifts to give. And just simply from, this, from uh, Indian Prairie, even though you are retiring, need to remember both of you are Indian Prairie. And that means a lot to all of us. So I'll give you our last two gifts. Oh my so God. Yes. <laughs> this is your opportunity to have one for yourself. <laughs> oh she got a bowl. And we move on. Uh, all our public comment is for agenda items, so I am now going to move to the consent agenda and superintendent report. Uh, we will begin with the superintendent report, Dr. Talley. Thank you, Mr. Razak, members of the Board of Education and Indian Prairie community. I want to first start off by celebrating our A-plus award winners through the continued support of the Indian Prairie Education Foundation and Wells Fargo Advisors, we were able to honor three teachers who were recommended by their students. These teachers are Ms. Amy Park, third grade teacher at Clow, Ms. Stephanie Ber Berdiak, sixth grade teacher, uh, English language arts at Still Middle School, and Ms. Jennifer Torza, physical education teacher here at Matia. All of these teachers see the importance of building positive relationships with their students, hence the reason they were nominated. And what I find most interesting when I meet with each one of them, they always talk about it's a team effort. It's never about themselves, it's about how their team supports the children. Our elementary schools have had two weeks of five days of instruction. I have been in various schools over the past couple of weeks, and in talking with staff, it seems the program is running successfully. All school staff must be committed for their hard work. Staff are working hard to engage with remote learners and the in-person learners. We were able to start our Ask, Connect, and Engage, or ACE time. However, the number of learners taking advantage of this program has not been at the level we thought. The students who have participated have used the time to connect with a teacher. We continue to offer the program as a way for students to gain additional support from teachers. Teachers and schools are reaching out to parents, inviting them to this program. I want to thank those community members who have started working in our schools to support our lunch recess times. I was at a school during recess du duty a couple of weeks ago, Kalashaw, and I know how much the staff appreciate having the additional hands during lunch recess to maintain safety. At the middle and high school levels, they have also started their process. At the high school level, five days a week has been going on. Middle school is finishing up with their state assessments. 
Through our partnership with Dr. Henry at Joel Ofsco, we will have a vaccination clinic for 6,000 students who are older, 16 and older. It'll be held at Neekwa Valley High School on Saturday, May 22nd, and the following, uh, the follow-up uh, shot will happen on June 12th. This clinic will be for students who are 16 or older here in Indian Prairie and District 203. Information about this clinic did go out today, and I recommend that families with children who are 16 or older sign up now. We will need to expand the reach of the program beyond our school districts if we do not have enough takers. Information about the clinic was shared. I've already received one email from someone, and let me clarify, if your child's will be 16 by the date of the clinic, it is okay for you to uh, add their name in it. They just have to be 16 by the date of the clinic. We will need volunteers to help with this clinic, and please consider helping out on that day. Finally, I want to remind families about the survey that went out regarding in-person and remote learning for next school year. The state has said that remote learning must be made available to those students who are at severe risk or illness or, may, who, who, or who may live with someone who is at higher risk. We do need to know who might ask for the medical waiver for remote learning. You're not making the commitment now, but you are alerting us that to the fact that you might. Information from the survey will help us determine the method of remote learning we will offer. There are multiple methods that we, to include the Illinois Virtual High School, to our, uh, to our teachers teaching the classes themselves. We need to know how big the remote universe might be for the next year as we continue our planning. Later this year, Perhaps in June, we will come back and ask you to commit and then to provide the medical documentation to support your claim. At that time, a decision will be made if remote will be offered to your child. More information to come, especially if and when the state provides more guidance that we, than we currently have. Though the survey has a deadline of today, please fill it in by tomorrow at the latest. Mr. Razak, I'll send it back to you. Thank you, Dr. Talley. We now move to our consent agenda, and I need a motion that the Board of Education approve the consent agenda items D through L as presented. I move that the Board of Education approve consent agenda items D through L as presented. Second. There's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Jeannie, please call the roll. Mr. Karubis? Yes. Ms. Deming? Aye. Peel? Aye. Mr. Rising? Yes. Ms. Grover? Ms. Donahue? Aye. Mr. Razak? Aye. Motion passes 7-0. We now move to public comment for agenda items. 30 minutes is allowed for public comment, and each person is limited to three minutes. When addressing the board, we ask that you respect the confidentiality and safety of our students and school district personnel. We also ask that those addressing the board be cognizant that this is an open meeting and available to all age groups, and as such, ask that you consider who the audience members are this evening and keep comments age appropriate. Public comment represents the voice and the opinion of the speaker. There will be no feedback from board members during the meeting, but follow-up will be provided by administrator as appropriate. Our first speaker tonight is Robert Shands. Welcome, Robert. Good evening, Dr. Talley, uh, board members. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak again. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Talley, for uh, visiting the STEM school last week. Um, I hope you had a good impression and um, got to find out what it is really about and why we are fighting so hard against its closing. Listening to the discussion of multiple board meetings of all the four districts, I felt a lot of disappointment, but also some hope that our STEM school is not doomed yet. At their last board meeting, one board member from District 129 was brave enough to stand up and fulfill his fiduciary duty 
by pushing the pause button to what seemed like a hasty, uncoordinated and worse secretive process of closing the STEM school. The motion to pause and not allow Dr. Craig from District 1 to 9 to withdraw from the STEM school until further investigation was approved, narrowly, but nevertheless was approved uh, by four to three. Um, I'm asking the board today, please fulfill your duty and ask difficult questions. Last time I attended the 204 meeting, it was really shocking to me as the discussion evolved around STEM and that as long as we can bring more STEM into the district, we don't need the STEM school. STEM is, is an important part, don't get me wrong, but what is apparently completely missed by everyone is the difference that makes, this, makes out the school, is its learning model. And that has nothing to do with STEM, nothing. It's that model that was going to be transferred, obviously including STEM in the curriculum, but taught in a different, better way. By closing the school, that modeling is going to go away. Again, the results of the model, they speak for themselves. You said you're going to bring a program about that would benefit every child in the district. Oswego pulled out of the partnership at the very last minute when the program was incepted. And what has happened? Nothing. In seven years, there's no program in Oswego. We don't believe anyone that says we will have a program after the school closes not after all the secrecy and gaslighting that has happened already in the past few months. If that still doesn't convince you, I'm appealing to your duty to thoroughly follow a process instead of giving into pressure from district leadership to follow blindly and buy into all the rhetoric of we are just voting off to dissolving the agreement, when that means closing the school. For the rezoning, you're doing what should be done for any school closure, follow a process open and transparent. I'm asking for one of the board members to bring about a motion to follow a proper process, pause and seek feedback from the community, from teachers and the data before making a decision later. Please do the right thing. It's your legal duty and you're personally liable for it. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Dylan Shields. Dr. Telly and the board, I don't understand why an amazing school like the STEM school would ever be closed. No one I talk to under, seems to understand either. Just this weekend, a District 204 parent who is not a STEM parent told me she thought it would be a terrible idea for the district to close the school. You should be able to keep the STEM school and put more STEM in the district. That will be best for all students. The STEM school produces leaders that our district and the whole world needs. Recently, a sophomore from Matea Valley High School started an online STEM program because of this. Students everywhere can learn more about STEM. I remember this student as an eighth grader at the STEM school, and I was in third grade. The teenager who created this important program says it's because of the STEM school. What if he hadn't had the chance to go to STEM, or what if his STEM school years were cut short? And last year, a group of four eighth grade girls from the STEM school came in second place at a large science competition. They created a cleaner exhaust system. These students have made a design that may be in your cars one day. What if you had taken away their STEM education? I have only been at the school for three years, but I was asked to make a six year commitment. How are you impacting my future by not giving me a full time at this school? What could I create if I had the opportunity to grow at the STEM school through eighth grade? And just think what you could do with the Zoom technology we have already been using during the pandemic. All the students in the district could join experiments and presentations happening at STEM. My two brothers would love to visit the STEM in their two, class, in their two of four classrooms. Please do not make a quick decision to throw away this amazing resource. Your plan should help all students, including STEM students. If you close the school, I don't know if I want to be a part of this district at all. Many, many of my friends will feel the same way if, if the district betrays us. My future is in your hands. Please vote responsibly. Please do not take away my school. Thank you, Dylan. 
and we're followed by Angela Shields. At the last meeting, I pleaded for you to listen with open minds and hearts, and I'm asking for the same this evening. I am grateful to you who expressed a desire to keep a commitment to our STEM students. Please take seriously your individual fiduciary duties this evening. Dr. Talley, in 2019, when interviewing for a superintendent position in Grand Rapids, you said you would not make swift changes in the district because it would show that you understand the history that is here and respect the work that's happened. Why isn't this the approach for 204? The STEM school that took six years to create and has benefited students and staff alike deserves that same kind of respect. Deciding to close a successful school only months after being in office and that was never visited until last week is not giving your due diligence to the process. In regards to evaluating the school, the October 14, 2020 Governing Board minutes state, Dr. Talley expressed that STEM does not need to be compared to any other schools, but needs to measure, is the STEM program making an impact with the students? Is this question of impact on students now irrelevant? Why? Because clearly the STEM school has incredible impact. And curiously, those October board minutes were not posted until March 23rd, 2021. And the funding that you plan to bring back to the district upon closure is dependent on taxpayer dollars. Many STEM families do not plan to stay and support districts who betray them. Has the potential loss of students been considered? As Ms. Peel said so eloquently tonight, trust is gold. What happens when it's lost? The school's lottery process that any student can apply to does not infringe upon any other student's experience. Many Illinois districts have dual language programs that are applied to via lottery. Should we banish those programs also since not all can attend? If that's the only fair thing to do, then there should be no music, sports, theater, because there's not room for all to have lead roles or starting positions. Don't hide behind a facade of fairness when the truth is this is completely unfair to STEM students. And you miss an opportunity for this entire district. In 2018, it was announced by that that teachers could come and shadow STEM teachers. This would be better than any continuing education a teacher could get. It's learning by way of immersion, just like our STEM students do. A group of teachers from San Diego wanted to take advantage of the STEM offer. But did our, t did our own district send its teachers for shadowing days? Teacher shadowing could completely transform the district in a way that a STEM coordinator never could. And there's a ready-made opportunity for district students to zoom into the STEM school. Why would you want to deprive district staff and students of these opportunities? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Maria Clement. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Talley, school board members, and other attendees for your time this evening. Parents have heard repeatedly now that there has not been enough STEM returned to the home districts and that the cost of transportation and teachers is prohibitive. However, according to the contract information published on the STEM school website, we have found the following contradictions to these statements. In section 3.2, teachers, in order to be an eligible STEM teacher, they must be tenured at their home districts. 3.2b, the teacher will be appointed for a two-year or four-year period. Since STEM only opened in 2014, under 3.2b, the excuse that there wasn't enough teacher rotation, while well, the school was only open for six years, a four-year appointment there would be one rotation, and a two-year appointment there would have been three rotations. So even under the laboratory excuse, you couldn't rotate that many teachers back to the home districts and only te tenured teachers are eligible. It is our understanding that the governing board themselves for the STEM school voted to change this rotation requirement in the 2018-2019 school year. But why? Section 4.2, students. Did you know the STEM school can operate up to 500 students? It's written into the law that made the STEM school uh, possible. If you want STEM to reach more students and teachers, why shutter a successful school model why not open it up to 300 more students? Opening it up to 300 more students would require more teachers. So it solves the issue of reaching more teachers as well. And we know that the withdrawal of 308 from the beginning of the partnership proves that creating your own STEM school takes more than just a single school year, since they still don't have one in place seven years later. 
Section 5.1 financing, each school district will receive a credit toward its share of the annual operating costs in the amount of $75,000 for each teacher from that school district assigned to the STEM partnership school. Section 10.2, the sharing of net assets. Well, that's bringing STEM back. What happened? What, what went wrong here? And Section 11.2, termination, requires two-thirds of the STEM governing board, two-thirds of the home district governing board, and two-thirds of the Aurora University governing board combined. We don't understand why this vote is being rushed through this school year after teachers and families only learned about it three months ago. And we only know as much as we do now because of the Batavia Public School District communications that were received just over a month ago. Are you comfortable that you have done your fiduciary duty prior to voting this evening on the STEM school? Are you prepared for the potential personal liability that you could incur if you have not done so? We are being told something different at every step of the way. We just want some transparency and inclusion as stakeholders before such a drastic measure as dissolving the STEM school occurs. Please give us that opportunity at least. Thank you. Thank you. The next student, uh, I mean, the next speaker, I think probably is a student, and it's Aiden. Welcome, Aiden. Can someone from the audience assist Aiden so we all can hear him? Thank you so much. Uh, no. Aiden may have it handled. There you go. Thank you. Hi, my name is Aiden Neal, and I'm a fourth grader at the STEM school. When I heard talk about my school possibly closing, I was confused and upset. I heard the word experimental used to describe my school. I told my parents, I do experiments too. If they don't work, I try something new, not throw them away. We also made a commitment to the school, not only us as the students, but parents, teachers, and the boards. To me, it seems like you're telling us that it is okay to break commitments. Not only do I want STEM to stay open for the current students, but also to give other students the chance to be in STEM, such as my younger brother, who is going to be starting kindergarten this fall. I hope you decide to take the time to hear more voices and explore all options before making a final decision about the future of my STEM school. Thank you. Thank you, Hayden. <laughs> Next speaker is Ron Neal. Hi, my name is Ron. Um, last 204 meeting, your vice president said that he would not vote on this so quickly if this school was in our district, in our own district. That says to me that something like this takes more time. I think that takes more time than what the board has been given on this. I mean, this is something that's happened almost seems overnight. Um, You've heard a lot of what other people said, and, and my son, he speaks better than I do, and he's only in fourth grade. <laughs> I encourage you all to take this time. Dr. Talley just visited the school. Again, I hope he saw what it's all about. I'm sure he did. I, I hope all you guys do the same as well. Um, we have such a wonderful model with this school. If that's what we're trying to replicate, why are we going to try to shut that down? I looked up the definition of commitment, and commitment means as a promise, a vow, or an agreement to do something, dedication to a long-term course of action. I mean, I get businesses, I'm in business, models fail sometimes. Um, I, I mean, I wanna see all kids in every district across the world be taught in the STEM way. Dr. Talley, you, you mentioned that you're, you're looking for kids that have this interest. Well, the kids in the STEM school, they're way past having the interest. This is how they learn. 
This is how they like to be taught. Um, I think every student should be taught STEM. I agree with that. I mean, you can see it in their test scores. And, you know, I, I thought it was a school for smarty kids. Well, it's a school for all kids. It's diverse. There's so much culture there. I've learned more about the STEM school in these last three months than, than in the last two years. Um, this pandemic we're dealing with, yeah, everybody knows it, it's not a good thing. Uh, I thank you all for doing your best. But the kids, you know, they're coming off this year and then, and then to tell them we're, you're going to break this commitment. Uh, I just, I would have a hard time saying that. I would have a hard time doing that. Um, at least keep your commitment that the kids that are in the school finish out. And in that time, that should give us enough time to figure out how to get it back to more kids. You heard Maria say it's built for 500 kids. Let's get 500 kids in there. In the meantime, you know, Dr. Talley also thought of a STEM coordinator. Great idea. But that's going to take time, lots of it. It took time to get the school ready and get these kids going. They're doing it. Again, remember your commitment. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Lynn Neal. Good evening. Um, as a parent of a STEM student, I am asking you, the board, to give us all time. Each one of you have, has been given a special power to act on our behalf and put our interests first. Before making a hasty decision, I ask that you make the districts accountable and ask all the needed questions and hear all sides of this story, and I repeat, all sides. There has been significant lack of transparency between schools and parents. Parents indeed want to help. We were never asked or told there have been ongoing issues. If you heard all the students of the STEM school speak and voice their opinions on this matter, I feel you would want more time to get all the facts in order to come to a well-educated decision. And even though not all students are here in person, they will feel and be severely impacted either positively or negatively by the decisions that are being made. All students are hearing what's going on and the message that is being sent by all involved in this decision. Students and families made a huge commitment to go to the STEM school. Why is it okay for that commitment to these students to be, to be broken? All these students deserve answers to all their questions. Who will answer these questions? I ask every one of you on the board, are you comfortable making a decision based on a few things you have heard from superintendents and other staff? Or would you feel more comfortable really seeking out students and talking to parents to make the best decision possible for not only the benefit of STEM students, but for the benefit of every single student in all districts? We have the best resources and we can make what was intended to be great really be great. We were just never given the chance. So many parents, including myself, are willing to volunteer a lot of our time in these matters. So many parents would be willing to pay tuition or busing, but nothing has been explored because we were never given a chance to collaborate on such short notice. I don't know if these are possibilities, but we just never had the time to collaborate. Another superintendent said, we believe we can take it, meaning STEM, to the next level, and continued on to say, but we're not sure what that will look like yet. Also, she said, we need to do our planning. Hopefully, the lanes will merge. Hopefully, she said. We already have a STEM school in place that is thriving. My question is, if they couldn't take time to look at this truly amazing model school that is already in place and bring it back to the districts, how do they plan to bring STEM into their districts without the perfect model? This makes no sense to me. I ask if it makes sense to you. Between the board, 
and us as parents, between you, the board, and us as parents, please, as your fiduciary responsibility, please take the needed time to truly understand this situation. These students are doing truly amazing things and one day may figure out a cure for cancer or invent something that changes our lives for the better. These students are our future leaders and they will one day be making decisions about you and me. We need this model school if we want greatness for all students in all districts. Getting rid of this program is the complete opposite direction we are supposed to be heading. This program is here for the benefit of the other district schools too. If STEM couldn't be brought back to the home district since it's been in place, I ask what makes you think it can be created without the best model ever? Who will create it? I don't imagine it is anyone currently in the districts because to this day it hasn't happened and we were informed it, as, as we were informed it was intended. These students made their commitment to a school of greatness and deserve nothing less. Please take the necessary time to make the best decision for all students and really think about what is happening here. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Next speaker is Edward Deems. Corruption takes many forms. There's hard corruption, like taking bribes, and then there's soft corruption, like sitting on your hands and not performing your responsibilities. The superintendent will say that we're not getting what we wanted out of the STEM school. Well, of course we're not. How could we be? The current superintendent, the superintendent that came before, and the other three superintendents from the other districts haven't done anything to make it happen. You know, and they're hoping that you'll gloss over that right now. They want you to gloss over that fact. It, it's like a teacher standing here complaining that the, the students aren't learning while they sit there at the desk with their feet up doing nothing and, and then wondering why the, uh, the students aren't learning. Of course they're not. And of course that's why the STEM school hasn't performed what, what it's supposed to be doing. The kids at the STEM school are getting a better education than their counterparts. The teachers, the parents, and anyone who's ever touched the STEM school can tell you that. They figured out how to have a better experience and a better learning environment. We finally figured out what to do. And now we're going to sit here and have a discussion about killing it, about ending it, about pulling out. The superintendent is going to stand there and have the nerve to tell you that that's the part of the, our overall curriculum that we're supposed to get rid of right now? The STEM school taught us better teaching methods and techniques. Which one of you want to explain to the public that we're not going to follow through on that, that we're not going to bring that to the rest of the district, that we're going to pull out of that and find something else to do? It's your responsibility right now to be asking some hard questions. Over the course of the last six years, how much time has the current superintendent and the other superintendents actually spent on trying to think of how to come up with a plan. How much time have they spent trying to implement that plan? Ask for specifics. What was that plan specifically? If it didn't work, ask specifically, why did it not work? You have a responsibility to be asking these hard questions and demanding straightforward answers. It, it's flat out corruption by way of abdicating this responsibility and collecting a check anyways. There hasn't been anything done to bring STEM to the rest of the district, to take advantage of this resource that we have. Instead of pulling out, we should finally be figuring out how to use this resource. Please do the right thing, save the STEM school, it's important and our district needs it. Thank you. Thank you. I think I may have skipped over Jennifer Deems. Welcome, Jennifer.
Good evening. Thank you. How much have you even heard about the STEM school until now? How can you possibly consider yourself qualified to make an informal decision like this? The superintendent has been here for less than a year, and this is the first thing you hear about the STEM school, that the superintendent wants to close it? It doesn't sound like to you he has been proactive, keeping you up to date, encouraging you to gather information, go visit the school yourself. How can you possibly take this away from our districts when you've been so informed of this major issue? Don't any of you have any questions? Why are you rushing to do this? Demand those answers. Don't any of you have hard questions to ask this superintendent at all? And I, I, these kids, how they present themselves to you as a board should show you something, what the school is doing. I really encourage you to not rush into this. Our districts need this. It's a successful school. As you can see, students are thriving and want to be there. My son has been there. He's third, he started in third grade, fifth grade. And he was on the intellect side. When he was back in his home district, he got shoved off, shoved off. Now he's finally in the school where he is thriving. And every one of you want to take that away from him. I hope you sleep well tonight. Our next speaker is Cassandra Kulak. Good evening. My name is Cassandra, and I'm here today to voice my concerns regarding the potential closure of the STEM school. As you've heard from many students in this auditorium in the past weeks, my son loves attending this school. He is able to learn in a way that is not always accepted or encouraged in other classrooms. He feels that his teachers at STEM are able to connect with him, and he feels heard by them. And I feel that he will be better prepared for his future because of the level of collaboration, hands-on learning, and interactive experiences he is receiving at STEM. The school's partnership with the community, allowing for visits by highly trained STEM professionals who share real-world applications for the principles learned in the classroom is unmatched. The board has recently expressed concerns about whether the STEM school is meeting its goals, primarily the goal of bringing the STEM model back to the district classrooms. I sent the board an email containing the 2019-2020 external evaluation of the STEM school and hope that you've each taken the time to read through this evaluation prior to your vote tonight. I'd like to read a few excerpts. Knowledge learned from the STEM Partnership School has been disseminated to the larger community through teacher presentations and school districts and shadowing opportunities for district teachers. STEM teachers attended and or presented in conferences as well as in district professional learning events. A few teachers shared their reflections about information sharing to the districts. One teacher shared that we meet with someone from the curriculum department in each of the districts on a regular basis. So that's one way that information gets shared back. We also host shadowing days where people from the four districts can come and shadow teachers. We also have offered professional development and professional learning sessions for partner districts. But it's not only teachers that bring STEM back to the districts. The evaluation mentions that there was a group of students that did a project on light pollution, that they then went back and taught a lesson about light pollution through video conferencing in their, element in their elementary schools. And finally, the STEM Partnership School is helping to prepare future educators that could potentially bring the STEM model back to your district. 
A student teacher shared, I am gaining valuable experience working with students in a different way than in my elementary education methods class. The evaluation concludes that overall the evidence provided indicates that John C. Dunham School is continuing its mission successfully. I understand that the district has a goal to bring STEM education to all of the district schools, and I support that. However, I do not understand how closing the STEM school will make that more possible. The school is providing an amazing opportunity to so many kids and teachers. I don't understand how taking this opportunity away provides a positive outcome for anyone. The districts have had years of opportunity to create a district STEM program modeling the successful and thriving school that the partnership created. You haven't done that yet, and I don't know how you're going to accomplish it in one short year. It's going to take a curriculum change that doesn't come in a year. Here are some additional teacher reflections, and I'll wrap it up. One teacher shared, not being tied to a curriculum or a text is very freeing for creativity, not only for myself, but for the kids. I don't have to limit them in how much time we take on a project, and I don't have to limit them in the mode they choose to show their learning. Another educator reflected, it kind of felt like there was a limitation on some of what I could do at my previous school, but at the STEM partnership school, it really feels like there's not really a limit. My son and my family made a six-year commitment when he decided to apply for and accept the STEM opportunity. And although he was anxious about making new friends and adjusting to a new environment, he knew he needed to fulfill his commitment. And now the partnership districts are failing to meet their commitment by closing the school before his time is up. He will once again be required to leave friends behind and make new friends and adjust to a new environment, only this time it is not of his choosing. I urge you to carefully consider your fiduciary responsibility as you cast your important vote tonight. There is no reason that the John C. Dunham STEM Partnership School cannot continue on its path while the districts piggyback off of its success and build a strong STEM program throughout the district. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to the action item for clarification for the audience. We need to have a motion for us to consider and ask questions. Um, so I need a motion uh, from one of the board members to approve the terminating partnership with the STEM school. Uh, Do I have a motion? My just point of order here. Cause yes. I, I think the recommend, recommended action as it reads um, necessarily isn't what the recommendation of the superintendent is going to be, so I think it needs a little explaining. And I don't know. And, and maybe we can maybe we can make the the most how that side of that needs to be amended after discussion. Sure, and I think that's part of the discussion. The point of order is to make the motion and then have the discussion, and the discussion may change what we want. Yes, to correct. Yes, motions can be amended or changed. So, can I just have a motion and then we can move on from there? Okay, I make a motion that the Board of Education approve the terminating partnership with STEM School as presented. Second. There's a motion and a second. Now we go into discussion and questions. Dr. Talley, do you have anything for us? Yes, at the last board meeting, I made mention of the fact that all four uh, districts and we need to remember the other partner in this is Aurora University. So there are five, uh, five partners in this um, collaboration. Um, for us, I had mentioned for, that we would withdraw at the end of the uh, next school year. I have amended that going forward so that it would allow for us to stay in the partnership until the end of the 2022-2023 school year. 
thus allowing any student who's currently in third grade to finish his or her program at fifth grade and any sixth grade student to finish his or her program at the end of eighth grade. Um, and uh, that would also provide additional time, even though we are hiring a STEM coordinator uh, now to start planning. Um, this would give additional time, but more importantly, it would allow for the students to finish their level elementary or middle school program. Thank you. Questions, comments? I'm sure we're all going to have them, so I'm going to begin with Mr. Karubas. Much as I uh, said at the last meeting, I will be voting no. This process is flawed. There's not enough information. No surveys have been done. There's been no community involvement. I would not want this process to be used as precedent to close any other school in this district. I recognize that this school is a partnership, and it's not just our decision to close this school. Partnerships take efforts. I don't have enough information to tell, to vote whether it is a, the right decision to terminate this school now, a year from now, two years from now. The process needs to be amended and started over. So at this point, when presented with a uh, recommendation to terminate, when a recommendation to terminate has changed and been amended, I would amend it further and start over. That's it. Ms. Donahue. So first of all, I will say I appreciate all of the advocacy by the parents. I've read every scrap of information that was sent to me. I, we've asked lots of questions, which we don't repeat here in public, but it's more for our information. So don't think we're not asking questions. Many have been asked about what is the diversity makeup of the school? How many kids have started with the school and finished? Um, each year. Um, I look at this and I, I see a, many parents advocating for their children, which I absolutely love. I see the children loving their schools. But I worry that many students don't have that same support or parental involvement. And so this represents a group of um, students that are elite in that way, and I, I want this to be available for all of our students. I am worried that we are financially conservative, and I've heard since the first day I was on this board words about the need to really look and address the STEM school at a broader level in the district. I support hiring a coordinator. I support moving to problem-based learning. I want to see more girls involved in STEM, and I think that we need to drive change in this district, um, and those are my comments. Ms. Deming. The STEM school has been uh, an area that has been uh, a concern of mine since uh, I joined the board, one of the very first things that I wanted to do was have an opportunity to visit the STEM school, and once I did, extremely impressed. Uh, I am very, very concerned about the opportunity for all of our students to have exposure to many of the things that uh, I saw there, but many of the things that I've read about as far as opportunities regarding STEM uh, nationwide. Uh, I want to see more girls. I want to see specifically uh, increased African Americans have opportunities for STEM exposure and awareness. I am very much uh, concerned from this aspect that we try to do the best that we can and, and operate uh, to, to make sure that we provide opportunities for the majority of our students, that, that serve the majority of our students in the best way possible. That's what I'm charged with, is looking at how do I make sure that I impact uh, the broadest spectrum of our students in the fairest way possible. I am very much in uh, support of us seeing those students who are currently 
in elementary at the STEM school having an opportunity to complete that, those that are in middle school having an opportunity to complete that. I would like to see us uh, have someone who can have a focus within our district to understand what opportunities we can provide for all of our students in 204 to have greater exposure and awareness and um, partake of STEM opportunities. Thank you. Ms. Peel? Um, I actually have a question, Dr. Talley. Um, as the current item is, is worded, we're asking for the termination still, but we're asking for an extension of the school for, for an additional two years rather than one. We've already had two districts vote to terminate. So there is uh, one other district that is still um, considering it. If we, there is only two districts that support continuing for two more years, what, what are the chances of that happening? Uh, do we have enough population in the schools to, keep, to do that? So you are correct. Two districts have decided to withdraw. We have another vote next Monday. And we also have to remember Aurora University plays a role in this as well. They have to be able to say that they are willing to continue the uh, STEM school or not. Um, any district can withdraw from the STEM school uh, as long as they announce the, their desire to, to uh, withdraw. So if two districts decide to withdraw, uh, and no other districts do, including Aurora University, then the STEM board will have to determine what, what will be the way forward. And that would be part of the STEM board meeting to talk about what that would look like. Um, and we st even if there is another district, if, our, our, if my proposal goes forward, or if um, even if we do not, but then next week um, Aurora West or AU decides they'd like to withdraw, then the discussion has to be what will the withdrawal look like for all districts? Will they leave immediately, I mean at the end of the year, or would they consider two years so that to allow the children to stay in place? And I think that is the discussion piece that has to happen by the STEM board once everything is presented to them. And that discussion was with all uh, five members. Correct. Okay. Um, I'm curious, with Mr. Karubis, your your points are very pertinent, um, and a lot of the points that have been made tonight by their parents are are pertinent too. Um, it, and I got to say, uh, Dr. Telly came into this district. Um, I'm not sure how much he knew about the STEM school before he even took the position. And I, I don't, I don't ever, I've never felt pressured by Dr. Telly himself to, to step away from this district, from this school. It has been something that has unfolded uh, from discussions that they have had as, as a board. I don't think Dr. Telly has been leading the way to pull this uh, school district away. But I think your point that this isn't a really good process that we've gone through. It's, it's been quite messy. Um, I feel like There was more that we should have done to keep an eye on what was going on um, and to get more thorough updates on the STEM school as we went every year. Uh, so this is a tough decision. And getting four school districts, four school boards, to agree on this partnership in the first place was so difficult. We started with a different district and that one dropped out and we've got another district to come in. Getting a school board to agree on anything is often difficult 
getting four of them to do it really took quite an achievement. So I do sit here and go, I'm not surprised that we're seeing some issues, but I'm also disappointed in ourselves, myself, that there weren't more questions made along the way. Um, and I do appreciate that adding an extra year gives us time to work through some issues. I don't think a year would have done it. I'm hoping, I'm hoping, I know that's not such a great way to go about this. I'm hoping the board will consider that two years. I think it's a fair way to go about it. It allows our students to finish their, their program in their elementary and their middle. And maybe um, we can have something that they can plug into in our district. Are you okay there, Ms. Peel? I just want to. I just have a really hard time. I, I no, me to, too. I Mr. Kruvis's point very seriously. This is not a very good process, but I. Uh, <clears throat> I'd rather have the proposal for a two-year um, extension in the works rather than just voting against that. So that's all I have. Ms. Grover. So I can I can understand. Hello. Let's go ahead. I can understand the parent. Um, you know, they were just told, they said in, I think it was December or January, that their school will be shutting down. I understand what we are saying that, you know, it hasn't fulfilled the promises that we were going to have as a district, such as the rotation of the staff, creation of STEM leaders, but there is a needs to um, and I was not happy that we were going to close it in one year. Um, so one of the things was, okay, can at least the kids that are there complete through, or can the kids that are there complete elementary? That way we are given two, right, two years um, for them to complete their level of education. It also allows us to get a STEM coordinator in, because one year is not enough. One year is just understanding how the school runs and then the STEM coordinator needs to implement that and see what the mistakes are and how to correct that. Um, I have a question for Dr. Talley. The STEM board, when do they meet? Like if, when would you give them your proposal? When would they meet again? We meet, we meet uh, in May, May 11th, if I'm not mistaken, is our next board meeting. So at that meeting, if we can say at least two years, um, we're not going to end it now, but we, we're, we're putting the two years, and they say, no, we don't want the two years, and we just want to get out, then we're left with ourselves or Aurora, or is that how it, it's going to work? So on May the 11th, the boards, uh, the various superintendents will present their quote letter. If there are three, including if AU is one of the three, then according to the agreement, the partnership is dissolved. If there, um, if there are only two districts that are withdrawing, then the partnership is not necessarily withdraw, uh, dissolved. Our statement, the way in which it's worded, is that we would withdraw at three, at two years, uh, at the end of two years, not within a year. So we're not saying we are in agreement to withdraw in a year, but in two. In any of those situations, the STEM board would have to determine um, what would be the process for. Uh, dissolving it, um, what would be the process if only two are going to leave, um, would they leave at the end of a year, they could decide that they would want to leave at the end of two years. That's the discussion piece that the STEM board will have to have 
about the way forward based upon the letters that come in. I guess I'm trying to figure out um, with the board meetings, the way they work, the STEM board and our board, um, if we take take them a proposal, um, you know, amend the proposal and say, you know, the third graders complete eighth grade. If they're not happy with that, they say no, can we then say two years and see what they say? So that way, is there something like that we could do? Or to, So amend this so that we would say that the kids who are, I want to make sure I heard you and I apologize, but um, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. Uh, amend it so that it would read that students who are currently in the third grade program would be able to complete to eighth grade. Is that what you're saying? Is a, well, I'm, a try possible? I'm trying to figure out what they're, the two that are left, what they are willing to do with us. It, so. it, all de it, it really depends on if the others, so remember, AU is one of the partners. They have to agree to the plan, or they can say, nope, we can't do it, we can't make it happen, so we're going to withdraw as well. So if they all withdraw and we're left... Then there is, there's then no partnership. There's no partnership, point. and then we are left to fund everything. We would not, because I think it would be, a, AU would it's have to be able to allow us to use their facilities, and I don't believe that that would happen. But again, I'm putting... I, I, I can't speak for Aurora University. I don't know what they would say, but it would be uh, there. They could say uh, the withdrawal has to happen at the end of the year, and the other three uh, or other two or four, it depends, could say that they also want to withdraw at the end of the year, and then there is no program. It right. has to end at the end of that year. Okay, I'm trying to. Think figure out, you know, like the negotiations, I guess, if Aurora says we want to withdraw after a year, if we come up with a two-year proposal, they might be willing to do the two years. Mm -hmm. um, so then I would be happy with the two years, at least we get yeah. the kids to the next level. Right, yeah, that, so, that's, it it's, yeah. could be part of the negotiation um, that is depending upon where um, next week Aurora West should uh, decide and then we will know what Aurora University is going to do as well. Right, I mean, I understand what just Mr. Kourbis is saying about the process, but at the same time, we have to be, you know, in reality, as in the other groups might pull out, and then we're, lo we're left with nothing. So at least if we can get the kids to the next level, that, that, that's my thinking, those are my thoughts. Mr. Rising. Um, so you said two of the districts already voted to disband after the 21-22 school year. Um, Let me clarify that. Batavia gave its superintendent the ability to decide. They have decided to withdraw, but sh she is able to make the decision for when the withdrawal will happen. Okay. Um, East Aurora, do you know what they're... I'm not aware if they gave that uh, same levity to her. And then I listened to West Aurora's school board meeting on April 5th when the superintendent gave their recommendation and they were supposed to have their vote on April 19th. Do you know why they delayed their vote until May 3rd? I can't speak other than what was publicized, uh, just to go back for some more information. Okay. Um, and it sounds like, um, from the comments tonight, that there was a split vote of what to do and to, and to kind of table it. It, it was a 4-3 vote, like, yeah. yes. Um, so would the coordinator that you proposed to the board um, is that contingent on, you know, I don't mean to put you on the spot, <laughs> um, but is that contingent on the STEM school dissolving or is that something that you think we need as a district and, and we could work that into the budget for that type of position? Uh, I'm just sense of right now it's still kind of unknown 
And I know you said you wanted to put a STEM coordinator in place as soon as possible, but it's still really unknown if this is going to go till the end of the 21-22 school year or 22-23 school year. Or So I'm just asking, mm -hmm. is this something that you want to actually put in place and that's a recommendation that you would make to the board regardless of what the result this is? I would, uh, because of the fact we as a district have done a lot with regards to uh, STEM when we think about uh, Project Lead the Way at the middle school, the robotics program through our um, working partnership with uh, the uh, Indian Prairie Education Foundation. And so, uh, but what we, we don't have are some of the things that have been discussed already, a more expansive view of STEM in our district. And so having this coordinator would support that. Um, I guess having a problem with the process too because any decision that we've ever made for the following school year, we've had to make that decision in the January, February time frame and now we're at the end of April. And um, I know there was talk of it um, with the governing board, but the fact that these boards are making the decision now, um, it, it, it just, you know, and, and I will just say, I have my original brochure from the STEM school. There's been, and the document and the agreement and everything else, um, there's maybe a handful of other things that have made me as proud as a board member as the STEM school. Um, in fact, there was four of us that were here, two of us a little longer, <laughs> um, uh, through the and, um, it's It makes me sad that we're at this point, but the reality is it was partner districts, and we were at a different place seven years ago. And if you want transparency, here it is. Districts were looking for ways at the time seven years ago to grow in their curriculum, specifically STEM. All four of these districts were in a very, very bad place financially. State education funding had been cut, had been prorated numerous times. Um, and it's my job as an elected official to advocate for our students and families and taxpayers. I don't want this school to close. Uh, I, I don't. But the reality is I can't freeze time. I can't decide for all four school districts. Each district needs to have, uh, you know, each district's needs have changed. Two districts have received tens and millions of dollars more in education funding. Um, from seven years ago. Um, but I have a hard time. We've got a perfect model in place. We've got, this was created as a laboratory school. It's not a lot of money. And it's a proven program with proven results. And I have a hard time turning that away and not using that to our benefit with a STEM coordinator in place to bring ideas that have already been learned and proven back. So I was really not comfortable with disbanding at the end of the 21-22 school year. I feel the recommendation that was brought to the board Thank you for that. I think that is definitely out of the box thinking. However, I'd like our position to be that we do not wish it to be closed and we wish it continues and see what happens and compromise to the end of the 22-23 school year. That's what I would like. So I'm not sure if I could, I, I think the governing board needs to discuss it more and see where other positions are at and see if there is a way. Um, and I'm not sure when that final decision 
made or not if it has to be made at the May 11th board meeting? The agreement provides that the uh, a decision takes effect a year, at, at, has to take effect at least a year later. So, um, so let's say, for example, the decision is to close the, uh, uh, to withdraw from the uh, STEM school is going to be for the next school year. You would have to let them know by uh, no later than June of this year. So all districts would have to let them know by then. Okay. I'm Sir, I, sorry to make you wait, first of all. I recognize that you want to speak. Actually, I want to just to extend the question of Ms. Grover and just to Dr. Telly. Like, isn't it true that it takes a two-third majority to actually go to a withdrawal? And that means that it has to be two that are for the STEM school. Because that, like, only like, if, even if you have three, as, it's as only a point of order. Yes, I I'm, was I'm a process guy. Public comment is over. No, I understand. Mr. President, yes, I understand, I, but, but, but I need, and, and that's what I was going to do before you started your question. I have to respectfully, and you got a little bit in, so I understand. Just because I, I you want to make an informed I decision, need to follow and I don't think the process. You and in fact, I may ask that question too. So hopefully, okay. my Thank my question will reflect. I'm, that. I'm sorry. Thank no, you. no problem. Thank you so much. Like my departing board member, Ms. Peel, I am still weighing my vote. It is a very, very complex situation, um, especially with the partnership. Uh, during my stay in my hotel room, Mr. Karuba said, listen very carefully at a late hour <laughs> in terms of the complexity of a partnership. I mean, we're married <laughs> to four other partners. And we all understand that sometimes those marriages with one partner go right, and sometimes there's some complexity there, much less with four partners. And so I have comments, I have questions. Some of the comments will probably please some and displease others. And then I'll turn around and make another comment that seems that I'm in, in contradiction to myself because I have, you know, many thoughts about this issue. As Mr. Rising said, I was on the board when the STEM school was approved. My recollection of it, it as one of our students said, it was an educational experiment. It was trying something new. It was actually a wonderful educational experiment because it combined legislators, businesses, university, and the public schools to try something different, something new, something collaborative. No one, I don't think, can deny that. But in my mind, there was never a promise to keep the school open forever. In fact, it was going to be sort of a laboratory that hopefully could be replicated back into the districts for one reason or another. Some of them, like Ms. Peel, I assume some responsibility also. It didn't happen as presented. Didn't mean that good or bad things weren't happening at that school, good things primarily. 
it didn't fully achieve what was written in the document that Mr. Rising mentioned. Like some of the questions, I'm still, I went back to the agreement. <laughs> I'm kind of, <laughs> no offense to the people who originally wrote that agreement. I'm somewhat confused what two thirds of five is. <laughs> <laughs> when it would have been easier to say three fifths for a STEM school, but that's just me. <laughs> but two thirds of five seems to be three. So we've heard from one school district, I think, East Aurora, that says they would like to withdraw. According to the agreement, they have one year to indicate that to the board of the STEM school, and then a year later they can pull out any school district can do that. We have Batavia, who sort of voted <laughs> to pull out, but gave the superintendent, and I understand that, I'm not being critical, because good school boards will do that, give the superintendent some leeway in terms of proceeding forward. We're considering it now, and West will consider it next week. We have not heard from, and it may be appropriate also, from Aurora University, who I think first want school districts to consider the issue. But it is true, Aurora University has not made a stance, nor their board of trustees have made a stance in regards to this issue, as in the agreement. That's correct, right? That is correct. Okay. So, any school district, this school district tonight, is faced by the issue that if any three of the five partners, the four school districts, the agreement clearly says if three vote, then more than likely, this STEM school is dissolved. Is that correct? That is correct as well. So each school district clearly needs to take their own vote, but they're at the whim of their partner. Yes. And still we need, to, in my mind, as I'm contemplating this vote, need to hear from Aurora University. Because I question the will of everyone, there's some reason why everyone, and I think including Aurora University, is allowing this discussion to occur. No one has put up their hand and said, absolutely not. So there, I, I'm trying to figure out what the will is. Some of it is logical to me. Logical in the fact that things change over time. That pedagogy changes over time. There's no one gonna deny that the students at the STEM school didn't do well. If anybody does that, that would be a misnomer. 
clearly more problem-based learning needs to be injected into school curriculum. But that will issue kind of weighs on me. I don't know if the board for STEM was secretive because their meetings have to be in public, like this school district, people start paying attention <laughs> when they need to or want to pay attention, and I clearly understand why people are paying attention. If things are going along swimmingly, things go along swimmingly. I looked at the evaluation of 2020 because a parent sent that to me today, so I looked at it again. And personally, I had personal discussions with other superintendents about the completeness of those evaluations. Their evaluations, but clearly they're anecdotal. I was hoping and expressed that need for more complex evaluation of the program. And maybe I should have pushed that further, but given that we were working with legislators, university, public schools, for whatever reason, I didn't push it far enough. I would still think if that school continues, they need to do further evaluation. Anyone who is in education could take one look at that and say, it probably needs more detail and more complexity. If I vote yes, my yes, is based on Dr. Talley's recommendation for two years. Because clearly I would have voted no on one. Because I think to Mr. Karubis and some other board members, point And to Ms. Peel's point, Dr. Talley was brought right into the middle of this <laughs> and has to respond to what he has to respond to and to other superintendents and other partners. I don't think one year is enough given the pandemic and given the timing of this. So my, if I vote yes, it's not necessarily I want to close the school, STEM school, but I really want two years. If I'm voting no, it doesn't mean I think the STEM school should go on in forever. There needs to be, there's a useful life for that. I think that was the intention. To bring it back to the districts. I get another question. If two schools say yes and two schools say no, then we're, we have to hear from Aurora University. Is that correct? Yes, because they're, they're the fifth partner. <laughs> And my, my final question is today, and I guess last meeting, we heard about having more students come into the STEM school. One of the things is trying to get another district, but given how that agreement is written and how legislation is written, we really can't pursue another district because it doesn't, does it exist in that Aurora University and catchment area? Uh, it has to involve only Aurora districts, so that leaves you Oswego, 
which pulled out at the last moment. And I'm not certain if there are any other districts in Aurora. So state law is written such that it must be contiguous districts within a municipality that has an institute of higher education. So they wrote this exception into the school code that basically only applies to the situation. So we're running, we can't partner with another school district. We, these are the partners unless state law has changed to provide that. Okay, I guess finally, as we call this vote, I want to be clear. And I'll explain my vote. I just did, but I want to do it once more. If I vote yes, it's because it's two years. And I think everyone should consider that. If I vote no, it's not because I think the STEM school should stay forever. But the complexity of the issues make it such that I would like the governing board to go back and see if they could provide further clarity to the boards of education and come up with a solid recommendation from all partners, all partners including Aurora University, about their will. So. <laughs> That's where I'm at. Can I ask one more question? So um, this proposal would also mean that there would be no new students starting at the STEM school, um, or is it just third grade, uh, entering third grade students? Yeah, we, we put a moratorium for uh, next school year, so it would be no more students entering, correct? I just, I just want to clarify here again, um, because a no vote would be no to the recommendation of ending the STEM school at the end of the 22-23 school year. A yes vote would be in agreement with dissolving the STEM school at the end of the 22-23 school year. Do, you, do we feel like the motion as presented is encompassing of Dr. Talley's recommendation or do we need to amend the motion? That's what I was just gonna ask Mr. Ray, uh, President Razak if we need to amend the motion. Well, again, <laughs> You know, sometimes people think these are done deals, and here's an example of where it's not. For me, and it's just me, this is at the wish of this board. For me, it would be easier to go back and say, this board really wants to pursue further discussion. This board really want, and I don't know how you put this in a motion, that's our legal team here, I'm just the educator. Mr. You, know, you know, to say minimally closing at 2,000, two years down the road, and for that governing board to give us a clear recommendation of where they want to go if they choose. We have to understand they made our that choice may already the complexity of this that choice could be made if West Aurora says yes and the board of trustees in Aurora University say yes it's time to end the school but personally for our board I minimally 2 years come back, I'm not saying keep the school open, I'm saying come back with a recommendation. So, so I would suggest, I guess for, for our board, um, the way I see it, shouldn't, I would suggest that we make 
a, um, an amendment to the motion because I understand what you're saying, but there's no guarantee that when Superintendent Talley has, makes that proposal, they're gonna even consider and being willing. So, so we should be prepared with what, with a motion that we feel good about. Yes, and I'm gonna leave that up. I'm at, have a half a meeting left. I, I would ask as, I always do in the public meeting, as some of our attorneys, Mr. Karubis or Ms. Grover, in terms of what's being mulled around here. Yeah, I think we should defer to Mrs. Grover on this one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking something all different, actually, in a way. I was thinking of the Batavia situation where we give the superintendent um, the two year, but then at the same time say to him, if they, Aurora um, and the other districts are willing to, you know, to have that negotiation power, so to speak, like Batavia does, we're kind of going with this, so. I'm, I'm sorry, I, you broke up and I'm not understanding what you're saying. So Batavia, as the board told a superintendent, superintendent that they want to withdraw, but at the same time gave her leeway. Okay. So my thing was um, to amend it in such a way that I would vote yes for the two years, but at the same time give the superintendent leeway so that if he could negotiate or talk to or reach a consensus with the other school districts to maybe have them go, the kids that are currently there from third grade go on to eighth grade or something like that. Just have give him more authority. And I, don't, I did not know how to amend that or how to do that or, that was my thinking. It, it's hard because you're in a marriage, right? <laughs> It's hard because you're in a marriage with all this. Uh, I mean, I personally don't want it to end, but at the minimum, I want it to go for two years. That's how I personally feel. So maybe we amend it and say minimum two years and we amend the motion so we terminate the partnership um, in two years. Well, I... Well, well, I, well, it's still giving leeway, I guess. I, I don't personally know. don't want to have. I, I personally don't want to be responsible for terminating the relationship. If there are other districts that feel like they need to terminate that relationship, but I, I'm just one vote, one voice, right? So other board members may feel differently, uh, may not feel a need, and think that we could do better with the STEM coordinator and. and um, I, I think we can learn a lot more in two years, especially with the STEM coordinator in place. Have, have you guys ever been this confused <laughs> about voting on something? Right. I mean, there, the other <clears throat> option is what if we um, give him the authority? Like, I understand have what you're presenting. Or not even present, not even have an. I guess just have an action item where he takes it and see what they respond, and then we have an action item on that. I don't know. Well, I think there's enough on the agenda where we could come up with anything related to the STEM school as we would want. So okay. I think whether we wanted to give him discretion, whether we wanted to give him discretion with bumpers, whether we wanted to say no or yes, or one or two, or two and come back with something, I think there's, it's on the agenda, and we have enough leeway to do that, whether we amend the motion, vote on the current motion. Um, so I, there's enough where we could hammer it out and come up with a discussion. We have a recommendation. We have a motion. And I think we're all trying to, through talking, figure out what the next motion would be or figure out what the next, or trying to figure out what a motion would be that w could pass that once again kind of tells me that our our process is a little messed up i think we need to vote on the motion right 
I think we're voting on the motion of 22-23, the school year 22. We're not voting on any other terminating in one year. We're voting on terminating in two years. But there's no, that's the, that's the thing, that that's not the motion. That's right, that's where I, with. So I say. we either need to amend this motion right. or vote the motion that we have, turn it down, and then make another motion. Can you explain? The motion that's on the table right now, I, I, it indicates that we would end in 22, at the end of 22. Where does it end? No, no, it's, that's it's, how it's we two would years. Amend the it's two years. That's the motion that, that's, that's what Dr. Talley would like to put forward. But I think the motion that we discussed last time, the motion that was that was that we just voted so we could have the discussion, is the motion that would end it in 22. No, no. No, I think no. that the what I moved was a very general termination. Right? It just says we're voting to terminate. And I think what we're really wanting to vote on is whether we want to terminate in 22, 23. And I, I believe that that is the motion before us now. Is that? Okay. Because it's it as presented, yeah. and what is presented okay. is the letter. Okay. And the letter references 22-23. Okay. All right. So was there I something think the else, Mark, that you thought needed to be changed? The... I, I guess my question is for Dr. Talley was the initial conversation that took place with the governing board, was it to prompt the superintendents to have the discussion with their boards, or was the, the decision of the governing board to look at potentially terminating as early as 21-22 school year? I'm just trying to get clarification on that. The boards, uh, I'm sorry, the superintendents were asked to go back and have their, their boards determine which direction they, as a district, wanted to go regarding the STEM school. Okay. And that is why the two districts have decided to withdraw and then do other districts, and then the overall university still need to make their decision. And then that's why I'm still kind of not happy about the process. Um, I think I think it needs to be refigured out between the five parties, and then um, you know, to me, the compromise is the twenty-two-three school year. But we can take a vote. So I think we just take a vote on what we have. So I just need some level of clarification from my own sense. With the complexity issue, I get the 22-23. I clearly don't want to do things within a year, clearly. If I was con to continue on this board, and I don't want to necessarily shift the responsibility of this to a future board, because I've been here for a period of time, but the complexity issue that I think has been expressed by some still weighs in the back of my head. So I'm going to have to deal with my yes, no vote based on that, right? Complexity is probably a factor for me, may not be for others. Is that how you perceive it? I'm just can, trying to, I'm trying to clarify in my own head. Well, can we and I think. The, can, can we state the, can we state the motion? Can Vice President Karubas tell us what the motion is before us? It was moved and seconded that the Board of Education approve the approve terminating the partnership with STEM school as presented. And uh, it, what is presented is a letter that terminates effective at the end of the 2022-2023 school year. Any other discussion? 
Jeannie, will you please call the roll? Ms. Donahue. Aye. Ms. Deming. Aye. Mr. Krubis. No. Mr. Razak. No. Ms. Peel. So, one more comment. If this had had the proper process, we would have had, our superintendent would have come to us and said, I'm considering putting a program together either in our district that would replace the STEM school and therefore I would like to pull out at this particular time. I think that would have been the process we would have were used to is some um, heads up well ahead of time without disrupting a lot of our students' lives. Um, but on the other hand, I'm sitting here going, uh, that process was not written in the books for this. So I don't know how we could have done that process. It seems it would have just been good practice to have done it that way. And instead, it seems all the districts were asked to go out and ask their boards to make this decision. I, I guess I'm going to vote no. Mr. Rising. No. Ms. Grover. So the way I see this is if I vote no, Dr. Talley goes in there with thing and they pull out and he can't even bring up the two years, um, which I feel that if he brings up that they may agree to. Um, and so I'm going to vote yes. Motion fails, four, three. Not to belabor it further. We need to have discussion still. We haven't given Dr. Talbot yet. We have no direction. <laughs> Not to belabor it further, but we could entertain a separate motion. Oh, I see. That would satisfy, I think, what Ms. Grover's trying to present. Um, but it is getting late, and I uh, you know we've talked about it a lot, so I'm not sure if there is consensus for that. What but is your motion, Mr. Karubis? I have none. I'm done. <laughs> well, I am offering. The motion was to, I guess, provide Dr. Talley with leeway as to what to present to the STEM board. Um, I don't know how to put that into a motion um, exactly. Well, Authority. We need um, to present something and give Dr. Telly direction because we do not have a board meeting before he meets with the governing board on May 11th. We do. We do. On the 3rd. Oh, on the 3rd. So that would have to be done. It would have to be part of the first meeting. Yes, before we adjourn. Yeah, but there's a little bit of an issue with that because the new board members come on board. But we could take that vote before we adjourn that board. You could. And so, two things I think I heard many people say, not all, I want to be clear about this. If there was a vote about whether or not we approve of Dr. Talley's recommendation of two years, well, a minimum that we just voted that down. Yeah. We we just said no because of the complexity of the issue. That the, the, again, this again. I get that, but we just said no. No, I get, I understand that, but 
It's in, in typical Razak style, <laughs> I spent a half hour trying to, and I understand your point. I, I, I understand it completely, and I'm not denying it. But to Mr. Karubis's point, have we ever been in a situation like this? Well, maybe it's an indicator of why we should be out of this. I mean, it's 50 students out of 26,500, and it's like hours here trying to figure out what we're doing. It's like, is this a good arrangement to be in? <laughs> well, again, that's a legitimate question. And I just... Personally, this is all, we're all coming from a more personal level than a systemic level to a degree. I wish the timing was different. Again, I'm trying to indicate my vote can go either way, based, and, and, and my vote is not, no, Dr. Talley, your two-year recommendation was terrible. It was great. It was, I'm confused. I, 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 I haven't heard from Aurora University. I wish that board would have come up, but they said, go back to your districts. I guess there was their will, including Aurora University, to close the school in one year. There's just, I don't know, it's... Can I vague. suggest that we, that we have something that Ms. Grover is talking about for a suggestion for next meeting that we can vote on that gives Dr. Telly some leeway with an understanding that we are supportive of at least two years. And I get... <laughs> No, me too. I am because I feel like we just that's what that was the vote that we had. I, I, I know, but no. I, I think the people that voted no are more angry about the process. And I am too. I think if push comes to shove, <laughs> kind of like I said, at a minimum, mm -hmm. if everybody's going to disband, at a minimum, I think all of us want at least two years. Uh, I, I think that's what I'm hearing from everybody. Like we would rather have it dissolve in two years than one year, right? There may be another solution of which I don't even know because. We, we have tied his hands though with that vote because he can't go there and say, let's negotiate two years. My board turned down two years. Hearing no motion. <laughs> Yes, and I guess the process of the board is to, if people want to bring up an agenda item, they still can do that. And how do we do that? For a future, okay. to address it, because so if, um, it's unresolved, and, and many people, it's not a simple vote. Dr. Telly, I know you're supposed to take recommendations from us, and I appreciate. Do you have any other guidance for us? <laughs> Not to put you on a spot, too. <laughs> uh, so I, at this point, uh, I would go to the STEM board and would say that our Indian Prairie has um, not made a decision to withdraw and therefore it would be that we are staying with the STEM school. That's where it would stand. Okay. And so as a board, we may still need to wrestle with this. Yeah. yeah. Okay. With everyone's permission, I would move on. Mr. Razak, for the next, even though it has budget, we do have um, some 
school-based staff who are for the social studies. So can we make that first so that they can get home and yes. be prepared for tomorrow? Please, please do. Welcome, Social Studies Group, and thank you for your patience. Uh, while, um, just to save some time, um, I know Brian will probably come up here and get this squared away so we get the next presentation. Uh, we do want to thank the board uh, and Dr. Talley for um, your time this evening. And I appreciate you uh, moving in, uh, up in the agenda. Uh, this evening, I'm joined by um, Susie Hansen. Uh, who's a kindergarten teacher at Bilta, and Sarah Burrish, who's a fourth grade teacher at Springbrook. Uh, they have been uh, working diligently, and I know we'll be doing some rooming and Zooming again tomorrow, and would like to get them home as early as possible, so I appreciate you moving that up in the agenda. I'm also joined by uh, jo Joan Peterson, uh, who is director of our elementary core curriculum. Um, we're presenting the elementary social studies curriculum. You probably re remembered uh, when we presented a little bit earlier in the year just about the process of how we get here. Uh, the state adopts standards. Uh, then our staff uh, works together um, on trying to develop uh, the essential questions or those guiding questions uh, to get to those standards. Uh, once they do that, uh, we get to this process where we come to the board to present uh, that curriculum. And then from there, uh, we continue to do professional development and uh, get to a point where we try to identify resources where we would then also come back to uh, the Board of Education uh, once we get to uh, that process with uh, resources or instructional materials. Uh, for tonight, it's just uh, seeking uh, for you to um, uh, ask questions and see the presentation about the curriculum and then we would ask you to vote on it at the next Board of Education meeting. So at this time, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Joan. Good evening. Um, I would echo um, Deputy Superintendent Icarius's comments. Thank you for um, giving us the time and opportunity this evening to the Board of Education members as well as to Dr. Talley. Um, it, this past fall, we were able to give an update on the social studies work uh, to date. And at the time, we expressed that we would be returning. Um, our anticipated return was this spring with some um, proposed curriculum. And I'm pleased to be able to share tonight that some very, very hardworking elementary staff members have certainly made that possible. So um, as Doug introduced, the uh, goal tonight is in line with board policy 640. And our intention tonight is to present to the board and the community um, in the agenda documents for this evening um, the proposed elementary school social studies curriculum that's in line with um, the uh, goal, the state standards for elementary for the state. This slide almost didn't have enough room for all of the excellent educators that have been a part of the committee. Um, alphabetically, this represents the teachers who have contributed um, since we began the work um, to date, and that group has certainly grown. Um, on this particular slide, I'd really like to acknowledge that this year, in the midst of all of the other things that teachers were um, working on that was new and different and pivoting and flexible, um, that this strong group of teachers, K-5 from across the district, committed additional time to be able to continue with our work on a path to be able to shift some of our social studies instruction and standards in the uh, direction that is um, going to provide students with some really great inquiry, uh, learning, and instruction. The, um, uh, on this list, I will say that it includes teachers from across um, all 21 of our elementary schools. It includes members from kindergarten through fifth grade, as well as support staff, and then some of our instructional specialists. The Illinois Social Science Standards um, were adopted by the State Board of Education, and since then, um, we have used those to begin the work that we're presenting tonight for, uh, for proposed approval. Within there, um, across all of those um, standards, 
The college and career readiness is evident, um, which is in line with the portrait of a graduate um, work that we have also done as a district. There is a, um, a seamless thread that also runs through the standards as well as the stage one essential questions that we have drafted and now are proposing um, in terms of helping our students that graduate to be civically engaged, socially responsible, culturally aware, and financially literate. And among all three levels, I know the board has um, approved uh, prior to tonight the social studies standards for the high school and the middle school. Elementary is no different. They're also, um, they were developed in alignment and with the guidance of the C3 framework, which focuses on making sure that the students that we have a chance to impact with our um, opportunities and instruction are college, career, and civically minded when they, when they um, move on past graduation. These five instructional shifts that are present on this next slide are the same instructional shifts that um, middle school and high school also uh, utilize in their instruction with students. So the, the components of these bullet points really um, illustrate that inquiry and collaboration are at the heart of what social studies instruction um, now allows for us to engage with with our students. Um, the literacy components are embedded so that um, across content areas we are able to support students with their literacy growth. And then um, the final bullet point is one that um, allows students to take informed action based on their learning. This provides student ownership and um, gives them the opportunity to gain their learning through questioning and discovery. The content of um, this next slide, um, what, we, what we have done as an elementary curriculum committee is utilize the Illinois social science standards from the state as the basis for our units. One way in which the elementary standards are different than middle school and high school is that they were developed around themes. So in addition to the standards, we utilized the themes uh, recommended but from the state uh, to support the development and then implementation of those standards. The um, grade level themes uh, are, an, um, s some of the content in the grade level themes is familiar. Some of it will be new to particular grade levels. But the most striking um, new portion of the approach is with our compelling and supporting questions. So the curriculum that we've developed, the, the biggest um, shift from the instructional shifts is that uh, before traditional social studies instruction typically was um, content was learned and then confirmed by asking questions for mastery. Uh, the big shift uh, with the way that we'll present it for elementary now will be that the questions themselves will drive the content that students have a chance to examine with primary sources. So rather than um, reading about the content and then confirming with, with some um, questions, we start with the questions and then the students are able to engage with their own backgrounds, experience, perspectives to um, discover the learning through the questions that are posed. It also provides for elementary students uh, the opportunity to learn how to formulate a question. So uh, a skill that is um, middle school and high school uh, work on to build as well. But this new opportunity for us with our social studies standards and proposed curriculum um, gives us an even more compelling way for us to help students learn how do you form a question and how, and how is the ownership of the question that you form a reflection of the learning that you're seeking. Um, so th this evening, we did provide um, a few samples. So um, we'll start with the kindergarten example, and I'm going to ask Susie uh, to share with um, you a little bit about the, the compelling questions and supporting questions you see here. Um, we did pull them from the proposed curriculum that's available for review, um, but I'm going to ask Susie to speak a little bit about this kindergarten example. All right, this compelling question um, leads us in the very beginning of the school year is why are rules important? We wanted the question to be um, very open so that it was thought-provoking and engaging, but it also allowed the children to think about rules just not within the school setting, but within the home and within the community as well. So um, our supporting questions lead the children down that path, you know, about why we have rules and how those rules change according to wherever we are and what we're doing. And um, 
why are there people of authority at school and at home and in the community and what different roles do they play and why are they even there? Young inquisitive minds will ask and lead us in different directions than what we have on paper and that's what we're ready to celebrate because these questions, the compelling questions, aren't and um, like guidelines. You're not going to get a set answer every single year. It's going to be guided by the students and by their inquiry like Joan had mentioned. And um, I really like how that they're connected to not just home and school but also to community. Thank you. Also worth noting is, and um, Susie mentioned this, that the um, the questions themselves, when, we're de when we developed our essential, compelling, and supporting questions, um, something that we continued to revisit was, do these questions um, happen over a finite amount of time, or do they stand over longer periods of time? And we tried to review to make sure that these were not ones that were um, so specific that they were just addressing one point in history or one point in time. And then the other piece, too, was for our kindergartners, as they are um, joining us in um, social studies learning, um, are they all able to engage through these questions with the experiences that they're bringing to our kindergarten classroom? So it is um, for some students who maybe didn't attend pre-K, it may be their first experience um, being in a room with 25 other students who have myriad uh, experiences that lead them into that kindergarten world. And we wanted to make sure that the questions we wrote could be viewed through the lens um, by a student that they would be able to provide their thoughts, their input. Um, their, their own real-world examples. So that was certainly a goal that we did as we were crafting and then revising and now proposing the questions that are a part of the curriculum for this evening. We do also have um, a fourth grade example, so I'll ask Sarah to speak a little bit to that. Yeah, um, we have really looked at the regions for so long in fourth grade, and there's so much to cover for every single region. The great thing about the fourth grade standards is that we're really focusing in on Illinois and its impact on the world and the, specifically the country. And I think that what's nice about this is that we're not teaching new content, we're just changing the way that we're teaching it. That we were teaching maps for Illinois, but now we're teaching it using inquiry. Um, when you look at our economy standards, the first thing I thought about was how awesome would it be if the kids got fake money that they had to use to spend on renting things for the day or what if I want to go out to eat and obviously we're not really going out to eat and we're not really renting our desks but just understanding that you have to use your money in a logical way and I think our standards really help to lend themselves to that and um, with the economy um, looking at like their budget they're able to take informed action which is one of the big parts parts of inquiry based learning is what are they actually doing with that and can they understand that in the future when they have to budget for themselves, how do you decide, can I go and spend $500 on this item or do I need to save my money? So I think that that's gonna be really great for them to be able to really narrow things down and not feel like we have to cover a thousand things in one year, but really focus in on a few key ideas. The um, learning that uh, brought us to be able to have these examples as well as the others that we have submitted for review and potential approval um, began, um, and to recap, with uh, we actually worked with one of the authors from the state who was a first grade practitioner as well, and she led some of our initial learning with this committee at its inception um, to help them understand not only the instructional shifts and the components of the standards as well as the grade level themes, but she actually spoke to them with authentic language because her feet were on the ground in a first grade classroom. It's experiencing instruction under these standards for the first time. So that's how we kind of kicked off our work together. Since then, we have stayed connected with the, our middle school and high school um, colleagues, and they have really helped lend some um, perspective as far as how we can support the growth of inquiry with our students <laughs> by really, even at the elementary level, it may be more guided inquiry as they're learning the skills. But we can, um, by beginning with that, we can help blossom the type of inquiry that middle school and high school supports with um, the standards and the instruction under these um, new opportunities. We did also um, spend a significant amount of time over the last couple of years um, looking at different materials that were available that could let us give us some, some examples and some guides of work that has been done in the development of curriculum for elementary um, in other locations. 
We also um, unpacked the standards, and then prior to this year, we drafted um, for each grade level, for each unit, some questions, which then um, that group at the time was just under 30 teachers. So this year, what we did was we expanded. Oh, I'm sorry, next slide. Sorry. Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we expanded um, to have the uh, just under 60 teachers this year. And the, the primary task for this year was to take a look at our drafts and then sort of take them through a review and revision cycle, knowing what we're hoping to achieve with our stage one essential compelling and supporting questions. And um, what, what I'll ask here is, Susie has been on the committee since the previous slide, so I'll ask her to speak to her experience in the development from the beginning. And then Sarah was a part of that larger group that joined this year, and I'll ask her to share a few thoughts as far as her experience um, uh, this year to bring us to date. If my memory serves me well, um, we started by delving right into the standards and examining those. Um, after that, like as Joan mentioned, we were able to look at some mentor materials with where we could find some questions and how they were writing these compelling questions and guiding students to um, be more inquisitive rather than just fact finders. So after that, we started authoring our questions and we um, took several, several editing opportunities to um, walk away from them, come back to them, and ask ourselves, is this really something that is going to provoke thought? And is this something that's going to lead them and be, as Joan said, over time, a good question, a good compelling question? And then uh, Sarah joined this year as we expanded that group. Um, when we came in, we already had some great ideas started, and one of the hard parts about formulating these questions is that you're thinking about what do I already have, what am I already using, and so um, as we learned more about inquiry and we really looked at the standards, we realized as a fourth grade team that we needed to focus in on Illinois and get away from the regions, and so we spent a lot of time basically rewriting all of our questions this year. Um, we feel really confident that these are things that the kids can understand. That was one of our big things. Was can a child understand the question? Because a lot of times these standards are written in a way that even teachers have a hard time understanding them. And so we wanted to make sure that the questions were accessible to the kids because we want them to understand these and to really truly feel these pieces as they're learning in social studies. We have the final bullet point here illustrates that our, a big portion of our focus for this past February 26th Institute Day um, was on social studies. At that time, all kindergarten through fifth grade teachers across the district had several sessions that focused on some of the initial learning that the committee had done, and that is the standards, um, the instructional shifts, and some examples of um, what we can look forward to as we um, move forward with changing some of the ways that we can engage kids uh, with content through some questioning that they have some ownership over as well. So as far as our next steps, what we're requesting is that um, the curriculum be open for comment until the next board meeting, and then we are requesting approval at the board, um, at the board meeting on May 3rd. Uh, pending approval from the board, our next steps as a committee would be to curate resources that would match the uh, stage one essential compelling and supporting questions, and um, it, both resources and instructional tools. And um, then we would return to the board for them to have an opportunity to uh, review what it is that we curate um, and provide approval for those resources. And then uh, running through all of this will be ongoing professional development. Uh, February 26th was a very exciting opportunity for all K-5 teachers to kind of take their first steps on board. So uh, we're gonna um, continue with that momentum as a focus for some of our elementary learning um, as we move forward with curation of resources um, so that we can be best prepared for the instructional support we can provide students um, knowing that resources and tools will come next. At this time, we are uh, glad to answer any questions uh, that, that anyone may have. Questions or comments? Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Susie and Sarah. I know you sat out there for over two hours <laughs> waiting to give the presentation. But for a non-educator like, like myself, uh, your presentation was one of the most important parts of it. So I, I got a lot of 
of value from that. So thanks for spending your uh, school night presenting to a school board. Thanks. Ms. Deming. Thank you so much for, your, for, for waiting for our discussions. Really appreciate it. OK, so for someone who's a little old school, help me a little bit, please, um, with, don't, um, with understanding the questioning, which, which I think is wonderful, that, that, um, that creativity, intuitiveness that you're encouraging from our students. Can you share with me, just say from, the, from a fourth grade perspective, if we're studying a particular unit, and we're looking at um, lakes and, and what the topography of um, Illinois looks like. I'm not sure if that's, but you mentioned maps. So mm -hmm. um, can you just give me an example of, of how we take those questions to whatever that particular unit is? Does, does my question make sense? Yeah. Can you just just a short example, please? Of sure. I, um, to give um, an example, it would be um, beginning the unit by saying, um, posing a question to the students along, um, how how do you um, how do you uh, see lakes benefiting our community and the communities around us? And a, a question that is that broad opens the discussion. Based on the, the follow-up thoughts that the students have, then, it, then we lead into more of those supporting questions. So they may say, well, um, it's a place for us to recreate. It's a place that we get fish from there. Um, but that's all led from a broad question of what do you think lakes contribute? The flip side to that would be um, in the past, we may have approached it more along the lines of, today we're going to talk about the important things that lakes do. And it would be more, these are some things that lakes, and being, this is, a, this is not an example that is one of our questions, but the, it would be, you know, um, we would have been more helping students see the facts that were presented instead of um, finding the facts based on a very broad question. One of the examples that we got from Shonda Ronan um, when she was presenting in February was that she showed her kids the, a picture of the Chicago fire. And she just asked them, what do you notice? And then what do you wonder? And then from that, then they created research projects, which then they were able to use to explore different areas of the Chicago fire. And depending on what kids were interested in, they may have looked at survivor impact. They may have looked at what are the safety standards that came afterwards and kind of built their instruction based on what they were curious about as well. That helps me a lot. I, that, that really, I, I like that. Thank you. That really helps me. That's my other question. Yeah. Others? I would just add a thank you or whatever. So when you go through this process, then do you test the kids on facts at all, like the different parts of government, let's say, is something? So there is uh, content, content inclusion and mastery is still a part of the standards. Um, so on slide, oh, let me look at my, um, on slide five um, the, of the five instructional shifts, um, the third one in particular is that that content and skills are, very, are still present, but being purposefully done. So um, again, the goal would be that yes, they learn some of that content, but um, it will be more through inquiry, guided inquiry and inquisition than um, uh, literacy and memorization. Thank you. All the work you guys have done, um, I know this is a lot of time with a lot of staff members and teachers involved, so thank you. Um, I know you realize, I realize you do your best to align to the state standards and even went above and beyond to create very important um, inquiry and engaging questions for our students. Um, I, this is one of those areas I wish I would have got my education degree because I get concerned when I hear only a just over a country ship test. Um, and I feel like sometimes while I believe critical thinking and engaging the kids is great to get them to talk, um, sometimes we lose that teaching them the facts of civics. Um, you know, but where I am pleasantly encouraged do an amazing job and I know our students are extremely well prepared when they go on to the next level um, but uh, 
I do have my concerns sometimes when it comes to civic stuff. So, so but thank you for all the work that you've done. Others? I just want to say thanks. Thank you for the presentation, all the details, everything you do. Thank you. Um, no, thank you, you guys. Great presentation. And um, it's exciting that this is a better way to engage our students and for a better way for them to learn those facts in reality. So thank you very much. And I'm impressed by the number of teachers that were involved in the process. Hopefully everybody then buys in because they're involved. So thank you for including as many people as possible. Thank you for the inquiry-based emphasis. Clearly that's the way to go nowadays. <laughs> and it makes our kids more critical thinkers. And thank you Mr. Carius and the team here for clarifying the curation of resources Back in the prehistoric days, <laughs> when I practiced, often the textbook came first. And then objectives came later. I think this is more effective process. I think it guarantees that, especially in something like social studies, we stay current. And I appreciate that you'll come back to us with those resources so that we can review them also. So thank you so much. Anything else? Thank you, guys. Thank you again, and thank you uh, to um, Sarah, Susie, Joan, and all the teachers who worked on getting us to this point. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next agenda item is our budget presentation. <laughs> is that, there he comes. <laughs> I almost had it. <laughs> Welcome, Matt, and thank you for your patience and waiting for us. No, no problem. I think if Jay was here, he would have found a way up a little earlier on the agenda, but I do recognize <laughs> I am, um, do not have his seniority, so no problem. <laughs> Uh, good evening, uh, members of the Board of Education. Uh, tonight we are presenting our second budget update of the spring. This uh, will expand an update on our discussion that we had at the February 8th board meeting. Uh, tonight's presentation will focus on the next three fiscal years, uh, fiscal years 22, 23, and 24. Uh, you'll recall in February we looked at a slightly longer horizon of five years. Uh, by narrowing the focus, hopefully that allows our discussion to, to also narrow to the more immediate uh, future. Uh, the main areas I'm going to touch on tonight, uh, first I'll update um, our local and state revenue forecasts for the next three years. Uh, we'll touch on federal revenue and specifically the ESSER funding. This is the area where we've seen the biggest amount of change since we talked in February. Uh, we will look at our operating expenditures at a high level for fiscal year 22 and beyond. Uh, and then finally, I, I do want to spend some time talking about our planned capital projects, both for this summer and going forward. Again, this is an area that we've had some significant change since um, Todd DePaul, our building operations director, updated the board last in December of 2020. And then finally, we'll just close by going forward what the final steps will be as we um, are excited to prepare for the 21-22 school year. So presented here is the uh, three-year forecast for our six operating funds. And you'll see for comparison, the 2021 budget is presented there as well. Uh, I'll just quickly mention we have covered during previous presentations that we are seeing some budget savings as a result of some of the hybrid learning and, and remote periods as we've, we've addressed this pandemic. 
Uh, we currently expect to see about a $10 million surplus this year in the fiscal year 2021 budget. Uh, the main sources of that, first, there, there is an excess revenue or increase in revenue of about $3.2 million as we're now projecting to receive all four of the state categorical payments. Uh, our original budget just expected to get three of the four. Uh, the state actually, as of Friday, made the third payment, so this, they are on schedule. Uh, I would like to um, tell you, but I don't think I, I can, that this is a sign that the state's turning a corner with their fiscal issues. I think this is more a situation where the state has liberally used the Federal Reserve um, borrowing ability that they have to, to stay current on some of these payments. But I do think that it, it's going to set us up for a situation in future years where we're still only going to receive three uh, categorical payments. Uh, we do have some savings on the expense side as well. Uh, as we've previously communicated, we've seen uh, a decrease in the need for substitutes uh, and some other hourly positions such as crossing guards, lunch supervisors, and then some of the salaries and, and other costs associated with athletic programs uh, during our adaptive pause. We've also seen some savings in employee benefits, uh, again, related to the reduction in salaries. And the, the third main area where we've seen some savings is in transportation. So with that said, moving on to the, the forecast, the three years presented here, uh, you will see that we are, um, are projecting, as of now, a slight excess um, for all three years. We did, when we presented in February, showed a, a slight deficit in fiscal year 23. Uh, that change is really uh, the result of an increase in some local and state revenues, which we'll get into shortly. But the main change here really is in the increase in federal revenues. Um, total revenues, when we presented in February, ranged from $372.9 million to $388.4. You'll see we're about $4 million increase in each year, uh, again, exclusively be, because of federal revenues. Uh, conversely, our commitment with that, those ESSER funds is going to be to increase the supports that we're making available to our students, and so we have shown an increase in our expenditures by about that same amount, uh, primarily in salaries and benefits, and we'll get into some of the um, anticipated uses of those ESSER funds shortly. The one other change with federal revenue I'll point out that's unique to fiscal year 2022 at this point, you'll see we're showing 21.2 million, and then in the, the uh, next two years, we're showing a decrease. Uh, one of the other changes with uh, a lot of the federal legislation that comes out is that we are expecting the USDA and the state to approve one more year of all students receiving um, free lunch. So for the district, this really is a net impact of zero. Uh, we'll just see a reduction in our fees charged for lunch and then an increase in, in the federal reimbursement. But this is going to be a source, um, a benefit for our families and, and a, a source of um, comfort and, and income for, for some of our families that have been struggling during this pandemic. I will say that our lunch program, um, even during the times where we've been fully remote, has been utilized as much as ever. And so we are grateful for this uh, legislation, again, that, that's currently uh, been passed by the USDA for fiscal year 2022 in full. We're just waiting for the state to kind of finalize some of the guidance on that. Uh, I'll just briefly touch that when we look at fund balance, uh, the ending fund balance and then fund balance as a percentage of revenues, those numbers are all uh, pretty identical to what we presented in February. So quickly just update uh, what's changed since February on our property tax revenue. And the big change has been uh, the new property number came in higher than anticipated. Uh, in February, we thought that the new property number would be 33.5 million. Uh, the final number we received last month was 42.8 million. This increases property tax revenues by approximately 490,000, and that is an annual increase that carries forward for fiscal year 2022 and beyond. Um, we did mention at the end of our presentation in February, we had some concerns at the time there was a developing issue with how Will County was going to handle their property tax distributions. Uh, I am now confident that that will not have an impact on our budget, and it will not have an impact because we're on an accrual basis of accounting, meaning that as long as we receive the money by the end of August, it will be allowed to count towards this fiscal year. 
Uh, if you're comparing to districts in Will County that are on a cash basis, they will still have an issue and they will probably show a significant deficit as a result of this change in the Will County distribution method. Uh, the final thing I do want to point out is, uh, as I think members of this board know and we've discussed in the past, the consumer price index is really the main driver of our property tax levy each year. Uh, that is based on the PTEL language that, that's been in place for uh, school districts across the state for about 30 years. Uh, we're still projecting a 2% consumer price index for fiscal year 20, or calendar year 2021 and beyond. Uh, some of the early economic data through, through March is showing that the CPI may be a little higher than that. Uh, obviously, it's still early, so we'll continue to monitor this. Uh, but I will point out that what CPI is in a calendar year really has about a two-year lag before we see it impacting our fiscal year. So that CPI for 2021, uh, the first year that that would positively increase our property tax levy would be in fiscal year 2023. Uh, moving on to state revenue, uh, as expected, Governor Pritzker's proposed budget included no change from last year's level for K-12 funding. Um, so we are, as a result, projecting the same amount of evidence-based funding as we have in the prior year. This would be the second year in a row that Governor Pritzker's budget does not include the $350 million increase that was called for under the evidence-based funding bill. Uh, as mentioned, even though I think it's likely we'll receive four MCAT payments this year, uh, we still have concerns about those, that payment predictability of those MCATs going forward. And so this uh, forecast does show only three MCAT payments for fiscal year 2022 and 2023. Uh, I will comment, we do, we did add approximately 470000 of state money for two new grant opportunities that have been confirmed for next fiscal year. Uh, the first, which I believe the board was updated on in the past month or so, is the CTE Pathways Grant uh, for 70000 That is part of our Grow Your Own program to encourage the profession of teaching. Uh, the second one is a $400,000 grant we received for the first time la uh, this fiscal year uh, related to the education of our, some of our special education students who are in um, a foster living situation. Uh, that's the Special Education Orphanage Grant. Uh, and I want to give a lot of uh, credit to uh, Dr. Sepiol, our Director of Student Services, who identified this grant as an opportunity to receive it this year. And um, she has confirmed that she thinks we'll be eligible for it again this, this uh, future year and, and going forward as well. So as mentioned, uh, the federal revenue and, and what's now being referred to as the ESSER funds is really the biggest change since we presented in February. Uh, there's now three separate ESSER uh, legislation that, that passed. Uh, and the total amount that the district is scheduled to receive is $13.3 million. That's a $9.5 million increase from what we presented uh, just two months ago. Uh, the ESSER funds, or at least the biggest piece, the ESSER three funds, are going to be available to the district through September 2024. So that would go into our all three years, really, that are presented as part of this, this presentation tonight. Uh, and in order to make sure that we use these funds in their, their most appropriate manner, we are projecting that we're going to use them pretty evenly over those three years at this time. Um, again, I'll get into the uses uh, shortly, but uh, on the slide presented a few years ago, we were presenting just over $4 million of the, that money in fiscal years 2022, 23, and 24. Um, the final piece I do want to spend just a few minutes on because I, I um, find it interesting and, and I, I think it ties with a lot of the discussions we've had in the past about some of the funding challenges with Indian Prairie is how the ESSER funds were distributed or, or allocated. And they're distributed based on the U.S. Census poverty data that lags three years from the current year. This is the same data that is how our title money is allocated. So it, it, it is an allocation source that's been used by the federal government in the past. Um, but I'll point out that that's different than evidence-based funding, which again, we've spent a lot of time as a, as a district talking about. And it's, it's not even based on actual school enrollment numbers. Uh, so that US Census data can vary and, and sometimes um, vary pretty significantly from what the populations we actually see are enrolled in our schools. So with that said, here is a, a, a 
quick graph, and I have about 20 districts on, on here. This includes all eight of our comparable districts, as well as um, most of the other significant unit districts throughout the Collar counties. And this is showing uh, along the x-axis, this is the district's evidence-based funding percentage. And then along the y-axis is the amount of ESSER funds that, were, that are received per student or scheduled to be received per student. And so I'll point out just a few, few things. The, the line going down the middle, which would be our, our regression line uh, in statistics, is really, as you can see, not really correlated at all with, with where all the dots are. And the actual R squared number is, is 0.21, which um, I do have to dust off my statistics a little bit, but that's, that shows um, minimal to almost no correlation between the two numbers. So in the state of Illinois, we've worked very hard to come up with this evidence-based funding formula that uh, you know, we believe, and, and as a district we've been a, a proponent of, believes accurately reflects a district's ability to, to fund education and, and assess the needs of each individual district. And here we have the largest federal funding source really in history that doesn't correlate with that calculation. Um, you know, I'll point out at the, the left half of the graph is primarily the t um, tier one districts under evidence-based funding. That tier one cutoff is about 67%. And you can see within that group, we have districts that are receiving over $3,000 per student, uh, down to districts that even though they're tier one are receiving just slightly more really than, than Indian Prairie is. Uh, moving right, you'll see Indian Prairie is, is the red dot there and it's flagged at about $490 per student. You'll see there's tier three and tier four districts, so anybody right of that 90% data that are receiving the same, more, and sometimes significantly more money than Indian Prairie is. And so again, I just want to point this out that one of the, the challenges with this grant and how we're going to um, be able to use it for, uh, going forward is that there are many districts, including districts that under evidence-based funding are significantly um, better funded than us who, who are receiving more, more money, more funds. And I'll just show uh, a handful of those districts in this slide. So this includes uh, three of our comparable districts, Barrington, Whedon, and Naperville, and I, I threw in Plainfield as well, just as a neighboring district. And this is ordered by ESSER dollars per student, and then in the first column, and then evidence-based funding is the second column. So that's the same data we, we just saw. Um, and you could see, again, the disparity that the, the top district here in ESSER per student is also over 100% in evidence-based funding percentage. Uh, the third and fourth columns then show uh, sort of that discrepancy I mentioned earlier between what the U.S. Census poverty estimate is and then what the district reports as its uh, low income percentage uh, when calculated using the free and reduced lunch number. And you'll see, um, you know, a district such as Barrington, which has a low income percentage slightly more than us, uh, but has a, high, a significantly higher U.S. Sensory, census poverty estimate is, as a result, getting, getting more funding per student than they would if we were doing it under the low income percentage. And I did want to put Plainfield in here because I think you can see, um, you know, they have a significantly higher low income percentage than, than us or even 203, but because that poverty number is only about 10% higher, um, you know, they're, they're receiving less, th in, less than they would under really the low income percentage or the evidence-based funding percentage. So, uh, you know, again, in, in my opinion, the way this funding has been distributed does create some winners and losers uh, throughout the state. Uh, the final comment I'll just point out while I, um, I'm still here, because uh, this was asked as a board question, if there was a way to estimate how much money we would receive if this was distributed under, say, the evidence-based funding formula, and my, my estimate would be that we'd receive about $19 million. So that's about a $6 million deficit from what we could receive if this was distributed under the evidence-based funding model, as opposed to how it was distributed under the poverty estimate. So with that, with that said, I still want to emphasize that this is um, a significant amount of money that we are confident will be used wisely and will create some uh, significant learning opportunities for our students and help address um, some of the learning loss and, and social emotional challenges we've seen throughout the pandemic. Um, as mentioned, we're budgeting about 4.1 million in both revenue and expense through the next three years. 
Um, the focus, both uh, in the legislation and it, it pretty explicitly, and I think in both the, the state and federal intention of it, is to address learning loss. Uh, there is a minimum percentage that needs to put to that of 20%. Again, we're looking to put uh, a much higher percentage towards learning loss, um, and also address those social emotional needs. Um, so some of the specific uses we're looking at is, is summer learning. I know the, the board heard a presentation two weeks ago from Dr. K uh, Doug Acarius uh, with the summer learning that estimated about a $500,000 cost annually. So we'd expect that to be, again, in place for the next three summers at at least that cost. Um, we're looking at after school programs. Um, we're looking at the hiring of a mental health coordinator and additional supports in that area. Uh, and then again, the use of diagnostic assessments and additional instructional materials throughout our uh, buildings. Again, the intention of the bill and our intention in how we use this money is to supplement our local funding, not supplant it. So moving on to the other operating expenditures, uh, we showed this same um, chart in the first presentation in February. I, have included it again and just wanted to emphasize um, kind of a good news, bad news sort of thing as we forecast our expenses for 2022 and beyond. So um, the good news is that uh, all our major contracts are still in place for 2022. Uh, so we have known terms for those contracts and as a result, we're very confident in the level of uh, accuracy we can budget those expenses for. Uh, the flip side is that for uh, really all of our significant contracts, 2022 is the last year that those contracts will be in place. Um, and so that includes both of our union agreements, both with IPA and IPCA. Uh, that includes our food service contract with Organic Life, our building operations uh, custodial contract with Aramark, and our transportation contract with First Student. Um, so all in all, that's, uh, that's representing about 87% of our district's expenses. Uh, as we've uh, forecasted in 2023 and 2024, we are making some assumptions or we are making the assumption that most of these contracts or all these contracts will look similar to how they look in 2022. Uh, but again, there, there is some uncertainty when we go back to our vendors or we go back to our um, union partners and, and work through those, those contracts. Uh, I mentioned earlier with property taxes, the, that kind of two-year lag we see in CPI, and I think that's where this becomes a little important too, that if we are in a rising cost environment, we may be in a situation where the costs associated with some of these contracts increase sooner and faster than what we make up through the property tax levy. And again, that's because that, that CPI number in the levy really, really has about a two-year lag to it. So moving on to uh, the non-operating forecast and our, our capital budgets, this is the three-year non-operating forecast here. Uh, again, our non-operating funds are our debt service fund, which pays the bonds that were used to initially build all district facilities, and then our capital projects fund. Uh, one thing that I included uh, in this update is a transfer in for the budget of 2021. This was not part of the initial budget, but the board did approve a $9 million transfer into our capital projects fund this evening. and so. We are now including that as, as our fund balance going forward for our capital projects fund, and uh, I'll be presenting shortly on what our proposed uses for that nine million are. Uh, again, compared to our previous uh, presentation in February and uh, when Todd DePaul uh, updated our buildings uh, facilities plan in December, we have increased significantly the capital money we are looking to invest into our, into our facilities. So this shows what we forecast or what we presented in December. And again, at, at December, we still had some significant uncertainty. We were at the adaptive pause uh, that was pre-vaccine. Uh, uh, and so we really were looking at putting the bare minimum into our facilities and really dealing with, with absolute necessity building envelope issues. Um, as we are now um, increasingly confident in our um, ability to, to operate here in the end of the pandemic as we look to a full return in school next year. Uh, we really are looking to, to expand our capital program for the next two summers. And so as you'll see, we are now looking at doing 8.7 million of capital projects in fiscal year 2021, um, 8 million in 2022, and then six and five million in 23 and 24. This is a $15.7 million increase from the uh, draconian presentation we gave back in December. 
So looking at some of the summer 2021 projects, some of these are already underway or will begin um, really, you know, the, the day or, or to the minute almost when um, our buildings are unoccupied and, and uh, students are gone for the summer. We're looking at some concrete replacement. There is some significant area outside uh, Nequa Valley that uh, I've had many uh, people offer to replace for us or, or help with, so I know that will be uh, well appreciated by the Nequa Valley community. Uh, parking lot and other asphalt repairs, this includes um, the uh, CEC and Prairie uh, Preschool parking lot. Uh, we are looking to complete the final phase of our Shore Road maintenance building. Uh, this is the building where we do all our equipment maintenance, equipment storage, supply storage. Uh, we're looking at replacing um, the orchestra pit covers at Wabonzi Valley and Nequa Valley High School. These are again a past due um, deferred item. Uh, intercom upgrades at many of our schools. And then finally, uh, an item that was approved at the last board meeting, uh, we're looking at doing a $3.7 million network switch replacement, which will um, greatly enhance the ability of our network uh, capacity in all our buildings. Looking forward to 2022, the again, this is the $9 million that was approved this evening. Uh, these are the projects that, that we have slated, and I'll, I'll just talk briefly on these. Uh, first, a building automation system upgrade at three of our schools. Uh, the building automation system is really how we control airflow and temperature throughout our buildings. Uh, in a COVID-19 environment, this has taken on a greater importance. Uh, we've all our buildings have MERV 13 filters in their air filtration system. This is the recommended level uh, by the CDC. Uh, the result of that is that it puts a little bit more strain on the, the building's air filtering system. And so the importance of, of regular maintenance on those systems and, and having an updated building automation system is, is again critical. And this will get three of our buildings that have again been long past due for this upgrade uh, up into a modern system. We have added back on the final phase of the elementary air conditioning project. This was a project that was all set to be to be bid and approved in March of 2020 and was actually um, pulled as a result of the pandemic and the uncertainty surrounding it. So we are excited to to put this back on our, our project list. Uh, realistically, this, would, this has always been a two year uh, final phase and so we'd expect this to occur in summer 2022 and summer 2023. Um, two other items that we in, that we included in the, this proposed nine million that are a little different than what we've done in the past with our capital funds is a 1.5 million dollar for a, a copier replacement throughout the district, and then a, about two million dollars for district-wide smart board upgrades and other classroom technology. So these are areas that traditionally we would have used operating funds for, um, but by uh, designating some capital funds for these, this is going to give us additional flexibility in the future. Uh, to use our operating funds um, on, on other areas. Uh, again, these are, these are both areas that have been deferred for several years that we've tried to do sort of piecemeal uh, through the operating fund, and, and this is an opportunity to really designate a, a significant source of money to accomplish these projects uh, sooner and, and in a way that serves our, our schools and our students in, in a better manner. So with that said, uh, just, just that's gonna conclude tonight's um, numbers section, but I will say uh, we are continuing to monitor these assumptions and specifically monitoring the state funding and any potential state legislation. Uh, I, I was just on the phone this afternoon with, with some of our advocates, and one of the things they're saying about the state is that it is eerily quiet right now, especially when it comes to the budget. So um, we really don't have a lot of um, a lot of confidence in, in what could come up during the, the last couple of weeks of this session or in the, the late summer, early fall session. Um, I think a lot of that is some of the change in the leadership in the, in the legislature, and some of it is still the, some of the restrictions in, um, as a result of, of COVID. Um, we will continue to, to uh, update the Board of Education, and, and the schedule that we have is as follows. Uh, I will be back on June 14th to do a final budget update for this fiscal year. Uh, starting in July, we will do an initial budget presentation. And then August and September will be the required presentations, again, required by uh, state statute of a tentative budget presentation. 
That budget will then be available for public display for 30 days uh, prior to a final budget hearing and board approval in September. Um, so with that, I will take any questions. Questions, comments? I have a question. Um, you, you mentioned the 19 million, it was a 6 million deficit. Was the decision to use the EVF or the, the U.S. Census or the EVF, was that a state decision or was that federal? Yeah, good question. That, that is a federal decision. And again, that's been the way that title funding has been distributed for many years. Uh, you know, it's, it's a mechanism that I think a lot of people have had concerns about in the past. Um, but, you know, our, our title funding realistically has, you know, it, it's only maybe a couple hundred thousand dollar difference. Um, I don't think anybody anticipated that the federal government would run seven billion dollars through that same formula. So uh, this is, the, in my mind, this is a, this is a discussion I've, I've started to have with other business officials. I think, you know, there was an initial sense of excitement and relief when the legislative legislation passed, and I think people are now starting to really dig into the details and recognizing um, this discrepancy, or, or, or again, the, the significant um, variance and, and inequities it does cause for some districts. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, comments? I just had uh, two quick questions. Um, you mentioned that uh, the approval came for them to from the to continue to provide food um, nationally, and, and is that going to be for the summer as well, or is, do you know? Yes, I, I believe we're we're still finalizing what um, what our summer meal delivery pr um, program would look like. But part of the part of our participation in that program, especially while we have summer program is going on, is that we we will provide summer summer meals in some some form. Uh, okay. So I, I would expect us to be able to finalize and, and communicate some more details out in the near future. And I um, that the the special education um, orphanage um, grant does. Was that, um, I just wondered, do, is that dependent, and, and I don't know, I'm not trying to get real specifics, but is that because we, do we, because of um, students that we have that, that are home, considered homeless, or is, how, how does that? Yeah, I'll, um, again, Dr. Seppiel really took the lead on that, and so, um, you know, I can follow up and get some specifics okay. for you, but I, but I will say it's, it's, it's based on us identifying that, that specific student population and the services that we've um, performed for them. It's a grant that uh, realistically we've probably left some money on the table in the past and, and just through some better data collection and, and uh, again, her hard work to, to collect that information and, and be able to uh, honestly submit the grant. It's, it's a very tedious process, but uh, again, for, for the amount of money, it, it was well worth it. Thank you. Nice job. So I was very happy to get the USER money, but then my happiness turned to disappointment when I saw slides seven and eight. I'm just very devastated that some of these communities that have you know, a high EBF are getting more money than us per student. And I understand you know, they looked only at the poverty, but it's, it's just disappointing. So my happiness was diminished after seeing your charts. <laughs> Yeah, we try and include one of those in each presentation. Uh, but yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and again, I, it, it's frustrating that as a state, we put so much effort into this evidence-based funding formula, uh, it, really involving a lot of uh, different constituents. Uh, there's a lot of data points that go into that. And now about four years in, uh, the state's no longer Funding it and the the sort of replacement, if you will, is is, is sort of a um, remedial um, funding mechanism. That is, it you know we went from using 27 data points to one, and and not use and not relating that need to the funding available for each individual district. I mean, it's, yeah, who do we need to start being more active with? I guess to make sure that this doesn't evaporate further, and you know, maybe it's Lend or whatever groups that we have to work with. Yeah, to, um, to, to Board Member Peel's question, that, that it is an issue that it's, because it's federal, you know, that, that makes it harder for us to maybe enact any um, immediate or um, real change, but it's, it's definitely something that I, um, 
uh, again, I'm, I'm starting to, to bring up and, and we'll, um, I think we at least need to make, make our um, voices heard on it and, and make our representatives know that we've, we've identified this issue. Mr. Rising. Um, yeah, I was really mad about the ESSER funds. It, it just goes to show you, and I'll just say it, how clueless our state and federal legislators are when it comes to education funding. And and I know, listen, I know they did great things on evidence-based funding in Illinois. And this gets to my first question. You say no changes at the state level for education funding. But couldn't one make the argument that if there's no change and it stays the way it is, and tier one districts are already receiving a higher funding level, that no change to education funding hurts tier two districts like ours the most? Couldn't that argument be made somewhat? Uh, I, I could make that argument. Um, I may be biased, <laughs> but I, I think that's a good point that the way the formula was really meant to design was to, to, to um, drive an overwhelming majority of the, the resources to the new resources to tier one districts. Right. And then allow that those tier one districts to kind of gradually encompass more and more districts, that more and more districts could participate in that tier one designation. That is meant to be a dynamic designation that should change each year. And, you know, we were kind of told to, you know, wait in line, so to speak. Um, you know, our turn would come. And now after three years, um, you know, we, we're still waiting. So I, I think that's a valid uh, way to phrase it. Which just leads to more questions as far as are they going to just restart things again, but that's not for here. Um, yeah, that's all I'll ask for now. Thank you for all your work. I just I, I just have a comment. Um, I thought it was interesting the, that the ESSER fund was from the U.S. Census Bureau, and I want to, I want to appreciate how actively IPSD participated in the U.S. Census take in September because sometimes we don't realize that um, participating in those type of census population, this is the result, um, right? Is that that's from the Census Bureau? Is is that what I understand? Yeah, that that's that's a very good point, and I know uh, you know our our communications team did drive a, uh, an effort to to encourage participation, uh, to, uh, very much with that that message that this. That the, the census really does drive resources to to our community, and yeah, this is this is a, a reflection of that. Right, and so I mean, we did a I think we did a phenomenal job in reaching all of our students through emails, and I just want the community to know because sometimes you wonder, really matter does. So. Thank you for. Presentation. Thank you for answering my question in regards to ESSER and the potential to affect state funds. I think what I heard you say and just need some level of confirmation is theoretically ESSER funds should not affect state funding, but maybe we should be careful watchers. Is that pretty much the gist of your answer to me? I, I think very careful watchers is probably accurate. Uh, and I think again, but with with two with a two years of a flat budget, I think it's. I think there's some implicit um, communication that it is already affecting our, our state budget and and uh, it, it could more. And finally, a request, when the air conditioning is finally finished, <laughs> could you invite Ms. Peel and I <laughs> so we can celebrate the long journey of air conditioning? And we might do a Karubis-like activity like scratch our initials in one of the <laughs> one of the condensers because it clearly has been a long journey so I, i'm requesting that when they're finished give us an invite right uh, mrs uh, I, I would love an invite we could maybe I, hand prints or something <laughs> yeah there you go <laughs> the the, L, the lmc's yes that's the the, the 
final piece is, is primarily the LMCs. Uh, yes, we will, we will grant that request. <laughs> with, with no further questions, can we move on? Thank you. All right, thank you. We, uh, briefly, we want to do the next two. Legislative advocacy, Mr. Rising, you want to make any comments? In I just want to make resolution? one sentence. Uh, resolutions were asked for by IASP. The due date is June 23rd. <laughs> I, myself, or another board member will be speaking about that at a future meeting. Mr. Karubis, do you have any update? I want to thank the uh, city of Naperville for updating their impact fees according to the work we did with the demographic study. Um, they approved them, so that should have a financial benefit to our district to more align the uh, students being generated from certain uh, households to our district. So thank you, city of Naperville. And I know we're clearly participating in LEND. Is there any LEND update? So um, I had gone to the meeting um, instead of Lori, and I had um, sent out PowerPoint. The big thing was the consolidation, which was didn't pass. That was the main one. Dr. And the Kelly, do you have anything from LEND? The what only other do? thing that I would say, too, is I would carefully monitor some of the things that are occurring in the legislature lately. Um, there's some special education things that are well intentioned, and but would cost school districts an inordinate amount of money because there's no funding that's associated with some of the good intention things that they want to do, but they don't provide the resources in order to do those and. We have to be. We have to serve our special ed students, but we have to be careful. <laughs> there is a bill requiring one hour of daily unstructured playtime for seventh and eighth graders. Um, sometimes we struggle to fit in the entire curriculum in a school day, and again, unstructured playtime is something that all kids need. But legislators sometimes need to understand the practical implications and see if we can come to a better compromise or a better solution to a well-intentioned idea. I know you've been monitoring things too, Dr. Talley. Any comments? No, you're exactly right. We have to be very careful of those unfunded mandates. Um, the, the recess one to which you're referencing is one of those unfunded because we'd have to pay for additional people to monitor. Um, and so I know as superintendents and with other organizations such as LEND, we are commenting, calling our representatives about ones uh, that there are some concerns. I'll be making calls this week about one of them too. Thank you. Anything else? Yes. I just had a quick reminder um, to everyone. Um, briefly, you can barely see. I have a little bit of yellow in mm -hmm. my scarf. The just a reminder for IPF, which is strongly um, tied to yellow, for people to sign up for the race. Um, we're 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 doing okay, but they're trickling in, and so just as a reminder for people to support IPF, which supports all of our students throughout the district. And I think I was going to do that in board updates, but I'm glad you did that, Ms. Deming. Anything else on that, Ms. Donahue? No, I, I would just add IPEF does many great programs for the district, and also um, any funding that's raised also goes back to the schools. So you're helping your schools and the district by participating. Anything else with legislative advocacy or Board of Education update? With that, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Do I have second. a second? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meetings adjourned.